Yes, a rabbi sold I to the merchant ships. Minutes after they took I from the bottomless pit. But my hand was made strong by the hand of the Almighty. We forward in this generation triumphantly won't you help to sing these songs of freedom cause all I ever had redemption songs redemption songs Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Have no fear for atomic energy. Cause none of them can stop the time. Hey, shout out to Evan Smith for the link. What is this, huh? Look at that with her blue eyes. Early Irish people were black with blue eyes. New documentary suggests, all right, more correlation, and now even science is proving it, what we're saying. There's a new documentary that defies everything you may have thought about Irish people. In fact, the documentary titled The Boring Heart of Stone, make sure you guys go watch it on PBS, it's online, claims that people who inhabited the land nearly 10,000 years ago were not white, all right? We're talking about what? 10,000 years ago? We're talking about ancient. They weren't white with blonde hair and blue eyes, okay? Instead, Irish people were black. Irish people were black. So again, nobody's trying to blackwash anything and nobody's trying to only focus or trying to make everybody so-called black. It's just truth. If it makes you uncomfortable, that's your problem. Cognitive dissonance is real. All right? Irish people were black with blue eyes, as first reported in Irish Times. Scientists in the documentary are using the technology typically used in forensic criminal investigations to explore Ireland's past and surprising new details. What they claim to have found is that black Irish people inhabited the island along the coast of the Barren as hunters for nearly 4,000 years. 4,000 years in Ireland. Who? Black, so-called black people, indigenous black Irish. Before they were replaced by settled farmers. They were what? Replaced? Huh. They are believed to have gathered shellfish and hazelnuts, as well as hunt wild boar in a region with a landscape of cliffs, caves, mountains, and more. Geneticist Dr. Laura Cassidy revealed that the people who moved into Ireland 4,000 years ago helped to establish the modern Irish gene pool as we know it today. Who? Black Irish. And Dr. Cassidy isn't alone with her discovery. In 2018, geneticists at the University College London at the Natural History Museum said that Cheddar Man, a Mesolithic skeleton found in a cave in 1903, had dark to black skin with blue eyes and curly hair, as reported in the Irish Post. All right, we're here in the Irish Post. We've gone over this. Again, this is the first so-called Britain, right? This is how they're depicting them. So-called black skin with light green or blue eyes. It says here, first, Irish people had dark to black skin, similar to Cheddar Man in Britain. All right. Irish Post is not me blackwashing. It's science, too. 
Irish people who lived thousands of years ago likely had black skin, similar to a discovery made in Britain this week, according to DNA research. On Wednesday, geneticists at University College London and the Natural History Museum revealed that Cheddar Man, a Mesolithic skeleton found in a Somerset cave in 1903, had dark to black skin, the blue eyes and curly hair. Cheddar Man, who had previously been portrayed as having brown eyes and light skin, was among the first permanent settlers to make the UK their home and is related to around 10% of the modern population there. Scientists extracted the DNA by drilling a hole into his skull and drawing out bone powder with subsequent findings suggesting that light-skinned Europeans evolved later than previously thought. Evolved? Huh. Where did you evolve from? Speaking on RTE Morning Ireland, professor of population genetics at Trinity College Dublin, Dublin, Dublin means black dub, dub, Dan Bradley said his team had made similar findings about early Irish people. So a bunch of all these professors and scientists, geneticists are concluding the same thing. And right here we have uh, Riddles of Prehistoric Times by James H. Anderson. It says here, the first inhabitants of Southern Europe, Northern Africa, Arabia, France, and the British Islands were a race of small men who did not average in height more than about four to five feet, four feet, five inches. They were of slight build with dark complexion. They were cave dwellers, em emanation from Lemuria, he says, all right? Lemuria. It is said that the first people in Ireland were the formations. They were of dark, stunted race, utterly savage using rough on route stone implements. So says, origin of the Anglo-Saxon race, a study of the settlement of England and the tribal origin of the old English people by the late Thomas William Shore. All right. In the Irish annals, the Black Vikings are called Dub Genti, or Black Gentiles. These Black Gentiles on some occasions fought against other plunderers of the Irish coast known as the Fair Gentiles, who can hardly have been others than the Fair Danes or Northern Northmen. In the year 851, the Black Gentiles came to Athcliath, Dublin, example Dublin. So that's the name, Dublin. In 852, we are told that eight ships of the Finn Genti arrived and fought against the Dub Genti for three days, and that the Dub Genti were victorious. The Black Vikings appear at this time to have had a settlement in or close to Dublin, and during the 9th century were much in evidence on the Irish coast. In 877, a great battle was fought at Loch Cuan between them and the Fair Gentiles, in which Alban, chief of the Black Gentiles, fell. He may well have been a chieftain of the race of the northern sorbs of the Mecklenburg coast. All right, so I'm going to read from this book now. It's called Early Man in Britain and his place in the Tertiary Period by W. Boyd Dawkins. And these are his titles. It says curator of the Manchester Museum and professor of geology and paleontology in Owens College, Manchester. All right, this is from 1880. A little further down, it says, in Scotland, the small dark Highlander. All right, Scotland, the dark Highlander. And in Ireland, the black Celts, the black Celts to the west of the Shannon still preserve the Iberian characteristics in more or less purity crossed with Celtic, Danish, Norse, and English blood. Another book right. is called The Place of the Welsh in the History of Britain by then Professor Boyd Dawkins. Honor Fellow of the Jesus College, Oxford, reprinted by the Manchester Examiner. This is from 1889. It says here, the place of the Welsh in the history of Britain. Again, ancestry of the small dark Welsh, the small dark Welsh. We need not, however, go so far as the Pyrenees to find people identical with the small dark Welsh. The small dark Irish, again, the small dark Irish, because we're going to get into the Irish, the small dark Irish of the southwest of Ireland, the small dark Highlander of Scotland, all right, the Highlander, who was the high? The Stuarts were in the Highlanders. And the dark inhabitants of Devon and Cornwall are physically of the same race. The recent researches of Beddow prove also that the small dark Yorkshire Mine and Derbyshireman are of the same small dark stock. All right, all these dark 
swarthy, dark, so-called black Europeans. The Irish Times newspaper. Early Irish people were dark-skinned with blue eyes. Documentary. All right. Hunter-gatherer population inhabited Ireland before being replaced by early farmers. Again, techniques normally used in forensic criminal investigations have revealed surprising details about prehistoric Irish people. What did they reveal, huh? What did they reveal, huh? <laughs> prehistoric Irish people were dark-skinned and had blue eyes. A new documentary claims, all right? They don't just claim. It's not just claims. The hunter-gatherer population that lived in Ireland 10,000 years ago do not have any of the pigmentation profiles associated with light skin. It doesn't appear. It's not in the genes. Stop making things up. They inhabited the island for 4,000 years before being replaced by settled farmers. All right? Let's get a close-up. All right? This is what they're showing as an example. So picture this. When you say prehistoric Irish, original Irish, this is what you should picture. This is what they want you to picture. You know, Bob Marley with blue eyes, literally. That's what they want you to picture. And you see his brun, brun or brown, brown complexion, right? The information is contained in a documentary about the burning in cochlear broadcast on RTE on Sunday. According to TCD geneticist, Dr. Lara Cassidy, techniques normally used in forensic criminal investigations have revealed surprising details about prehistoric Irish people. Scientists have been developing a genetic database of ancient Irish genomes from all periods of prehistory to understand how the modern Irish gene pool came about. She said the hunter-gatherer Irish not only had dark skin, but also bright blue eyes, a combination rarely seen today. They operated mostly along the coast of the Burren, gathering shellfish and then moving inland to hunt wild boar and gather hazelnuts. The Burren's unique geological landscape means it has preserved evidence of millennia of settlement in the area of West Clare. The hunter-gatherers were replaced by early farmers, the earliest evidence of farmers in Ireland in the Burren. They arrived approximately 6,000 years ago in what has now, in what was known as the Neolithic era. So again, here's a, a better picture. So this is what they want you to picture again, when you're thinking about prehistoric Irish. So I want to just remind everybody, and, you know, just because you see people with blue eyes doesn't mean they have a, a white ancestor. This was original to black folks too, people of color, indigenous people around the world. And when you say Irish, it doesn't mean it was a white ancestor, okay? So you got to really rethink your genealogy and your ancestry and look at it with fresh new eyes. I'm going to read from this book real quick. It says here, Proclamation. 1625, America's Enslavement of the Irish by Herbert L. Byrd, Jr. And this is uh, chapter three. It says you're transported and it's going to talk about Charles the First. All right, we're going to go to the next page. It says Charles continued his father's quest with the colonization of Ireland and the attempted eradication of its people. Listen to this. The jails were emptied of Irish prisoners and ready for transport to be sold as slaves. Slaves, right? Sold as slaves, okay? Over 30,000 prisoners were shipped to Barbados, Montserrat, St. Lucia, St. Christopher, now St. Kitts, and the mainland British colonies. So all the way back with Charles I, they were doing this in Ireland, sending them to where? The plantations of the Americas. Who? Irish. But the Irish prisoners' numbers were not enough for the labor required in the mainland colonies and the sugar plantations in the West Indies. So the spirit kidnappers went to work to meet the market demand. All right, remember, we've gone over this. Spiriting was literally kidnapping. They were spiriting children, Adults, all kinds of people, the unwanted, poor people all over Europe, especially with the Irish, and sending them to the colonies of America to work in the plantations. It wasn't Africans they were sending over here because they already had the labor with the American Indians, the local labor they could enslave. When they needed more, they were sending their unwanted, undesirables of Europe. 
as it says here. They were spiriting, kidnapping people and children, children, swarthy Europeans. Don't think these are pale skin only. Just as the British authorities did to the English poor, just like they did to the English poor, this is what I'm saying. The authorities made the Irish prisoners by creating petty crimes against them. If you were Irish, once you became a prisoner, you were legible to be transported and sold as a slave. The slave trade was very profitable and the kidnappers set out to round up the Irish. Groups of kidnappers went out to fill quotas by capturing whomever crossed their paths. The kidnappers at times were overly zealous and captured a number of French and English and several thousand Scots in the process. Throw them all in there, right? If these victims weren't saved in time by a loved one with power or money, their capture was steadfast. In 1629, all right, all the way back in the 1600s, a large group of Irish men and women were sent to Guiana, right? Guiana, where? Guiana. They were sent to Guiana, French Guiana. Remember we saw that video? Hmm. What if a lot of those Maroons, right, were actually Black Irish that were joining these tribes in the Amazon, right? You got to dodge the hijack. That's what I'm saying. It's not always Indian. Again, a large group of Irishmen and women were sent to Guiana. And by 1632, Irish were the main slaves sold to Antigua and Montserrat in the West Indies. They were the main slaves, Irish. All right. So think about it. If these were all pale skinned white people like you're thinking today, where is their descendants? These people on these islands should be a lot lighter if that's the case. But in reality, these were swarthy Irish, so-called Negro Irish. They were getting rid of in Ireland. Just something to think about. I mean, be logical, right? By 1637, a census showed that 69% of the inhabitants of Montserrat in the West Indies were Irish slaves. All right? There's footnotes for this. The first groups of English prisoners and kidnapped children had experienced inhumane conditions on the ships. But the Irish prisoners transport to the New World was far worse. The Irish slaves were chained in holds that were on average six square feet. They were chained from ankle to wrist. In addition, the male slaves were chained by their neck to prevent attacks to crew members who went below deck. I listen. These were not Africans. They always told you it was Africans. Remember, these are black Irish. They were chained from ankle to wrist. In addition, the male slaves were chained by their necks to prevent attacks to crew members who went below deck. When the slaves were brought on deck, 40 to 50 of them were chained together to keep them from trying to stage a mutiny or commit suicide by jumping overboard. These are the same stories they told us about so-called African slaves. Hygiene was non-existent and slaves experienced dehydration, dysentery, and scurvy, which led to high mortality rates. Many were thrown overboard to avoid infecting others. This was not good. The slave owners saw this as a loss of profit. Again, you see, this is a real middle passage. This is really happening. This is recorded. But they told you it was happening in a different way. And they told you it was coming out of Africa. And that was false. The passage across the Atlantic typically would take nine to 12 weeks, depending on the weather. Food was always an issue aboard ship. There sometimes wasn't enough food to feed both the slaves and the crew. If a slave died due to starvation during the passage, the insurance company would pay for the loss. All right, they were insured. Listen to this. This is a real venture, a business venture. They had charters business, right? Companies, right? The Summers Island companies, the Virginia company, Massachusetts, the Plymouth company. So they had insurance backing any losses up. So when there was a food shortage, the solution was to throw slaves overboard. The ship's captain would claim they died of sickness or were lost at sea. One ship was cited for dumping 1,302 Irish slaves into the Atlantic Ocean on a single passage so that the crew would have plenty of food to eat. All right. This is recorded. And the ship's names and everything. We've read this information before a lot. Check out my indentured servitude, white servitude videos. 
Under the worst of conditions such as sickness, suicide, and even murder at the hands of the slave crew and captains, ships will lose most of their human cargo. On average, the Irish slave ships lost 20 to 30 percent on the passage to the New World. And in the bottom paragraph here regarding uh, Oliver Cromwell and the uh, Irish Protestants and uh, Catholic Irish in their war, the Irish Rebellion of 1641, and then uh, Oliver Cromwell's retaliation, he was Protestant. So it says here, Cromwell harbored a hostile attitude toward the Irish for both religious and political reasons. He was passionately opposed to the Catholic Church because of the power of the papal and clerical authority over the people. As for political reasons, the Irish killing of Protestants during the Irish Rebellion of 1641 was foremost on his mind. Cromwell started his war with Ireland in August 1649 with an attack against Drogheda. Drogheda, a prosperous town just north of Dublin. Remember, Dublin means black. Cromwell army overtook the town, slaughtering soldiers, men, women, and children. Catholic priests were considered combatants and were killed on sight. Cromwell, in his first letter back to the Council of State, said of Drogheda, I believe we put the sword the whole number of the defendants. I do not think 30 of the whole number escaped with their lives. Over 3,500 people died in the massacre. Those who survived were transported and sold as slaves to the West Indies and the American colonies. Slaves, all right? Slaves to the West Indies. Cromwell wrote after the campaign, I am persuaded that this is a righteous judgment of God upon these barbarous wretches who have imbrued their hands in so much innocent blood and that will tend to prevent the infusion of blood for the future, which are satisfactory grounds for such actions which otherwise cannot but work, remorse, and regret. That's Oliver Cromwell's words. He really hated the Catholics. Remember the Protestants, the crypto Jews, and crypto Moors, a lot of them. All right, so the format of the images and the text here is really bad in this book, but I can kind of see the wording. His assessor with each victory, Com Cromwell and his generals cleansed the land of the Irish. Thousands were transported and sold as slaves massive transportation of the Irish across the Atlantic to the New World continued and reached its peak in 1652 to 1653. The Council of State authorized the governors of precincts to transport and sell as slaves 8,000 Irish. They also granted the authorization to transport and sell as slaves 400 Irish children for the New England and Virginia colonies. Slave contracts were assigned with Boston merchants, allowing them to come and score the ports along Ireland's southern and eastern coast to capture men and women. Hundreds of Irish men and women were captured at the ports and transported to the New World. With the abductions and kidnappings at the levels they were, even some English and Scottish were captured and sent to Barbados to work in the sugarcane fields or to Virginia. Continuing a little further in the book with Cromwell's mission to get rid of the Irish Catholics, right? It says, during the 12 years of Irish rebellion, we're at the bottom here, the Irish population fell from 1,466,000 to 616,000. Over 550 Irishmen were killed and 300,000 were sold as slaves to the sugar planters in Barbados, in Jamaica, and throughout the West Indies. The women and children who were left homeless and destitute also had to be dealt with. The British solution was to round them up and sell them as slaves. Over 100,000 Irish Catholic children were taken from their parents and sold as slaves, many to Virginia and New England. After Cromwell returned to England, one of his generals, General Henry Ireton adopted a policy of deliberate crop burning and starvation. That policy was responsible for the majority of the estimated deaths. We continue in chapter four. It says here, arrival from the ship. Upon arrival in the colonies, Irish slaves were put up for sale by the ship captains or the merchants who owned them. Families who made the passage together to the new world were often separated when each was sold to the highest bidder. 
they were paraded before the bidders like cattle at a livestock auction. Again, same stories they told us they were doing to these so-called Africans. They were doing this to Irish. And again, remember, these are so-called black Irish. Put it all into perspective. Their teeth were sometimes checked and many had to strip naked for the buyer's inspection. In the year 1651-1660, Oliver Cromwell alone is said to have had transported over 130,000 Irish slaves to the American colonies and the West Indies. The estimates vary among renowned historians. John P. Prendergast estimates 80,000, Anthony Brudine 100,000, Thomas Addis Emmett 120 to 130,000, and Dr. John Lingard 60,000. Now, I'm going to ask you a logical question. Now, you see all these numbers that would multiply. These people would have descendants. And all these places where they ended up in the West Indies, you know, you would see more lighter skinned so-called white people there living. And you guys know that most of the people in these islands are so-called black folks. There aren't exact statistics on the transport of Irish slaves for various reasons. For one, ships weren't allowed to sail directly from Ireland to the New World. By law, they had to visit an English port before clearance papers would be granted. As a result, every Irish immigrant, slave or servant, crossing in an Irish or English vessel from either Ireland or England appeared in the official records as English. All right, a lot of them were labeled English. According to law, the voyage didn't begin until the ship cleared from English port. Hence, all the passengers on arrival in the American colonies were rated as English. All right, so uh, here again, the image is a little messed up on the text, but these are some runaway ads. Okay, I've shown this a lot. We're going to show some examples. It's shown some here. Um, I'm going to read here again. It says the following advertisements for runaways are from the Maryland Gazette, the Virginia Gazette, the Pennsylvania Gazette, we've shown these. All right, check this one out right here. It says, run away from the subscriber living in Lancaster. A native Irish servant woman named Katie Norton, who came from the county of Wicklow in Ireland. Last fall, she is about 25 to 26 years of age, of a dark complexion, all right? Swarty, dark complexion, has black hair, talks in the Irish dialect. She rocks in her walk, all right? She rocks in her walk <laughs> and is pretty sharp in talking. She is a cunning hussy and no doubt will pass a while for an honest woman as she has good clothes with her and can behave herself, all right? So that's her description, dark complexion, a native Irish servant. And there's another one right here. It says, run away last night from the workhouse in Chester, a servant girl that belonged to Thomas Blair in West New Jersey. She was advertised some time ago in the Gazette by the name of Elizabeth Burke, but changes her name often. Is about 18 years of age, of small stature, dark complexion, and speaks much through her nose. All right. Again, dark complexion. Had on a blue Kalimunkogo stripped Lindsay petite coat and black silk bonnet was barefooted. Four pounds reward and reasonable charges. All right. Again, dark complexion. These are all Irish. Right here in the notes, it says runaway servants and slaves would often take refuge in a nearby friendly Indian community. All right. Who? Irish, dark skinned Irish. Yes. It's not just Indian maroons. OK, this is what I'm trying to explain to you. Those who weren't caught and brought back to the colonies assimilated well into the Native American communities who black Irish runaways. Six. Oh, no, 1736, when George Washington was six years old, it says here, his father, Augustine Washington, placed an advertisement seeking the capture of a servant of his who had run away in company with other servants. Now, remember, George Washington, I did a whole video on this. He only had mostly indentured servants, Europeans, in his plantation. All right, go check out the video. Edward Ormsby is a small thing fellow of a swarthy complexion swarthy complexion and is a tailor by trade has a hesitation of stammering in his speech and being an irishman in his swarthy complexion had a good deal of brogue they went away from captain Isla's landing on potomac in a small boat and are supposed to be gone towards the eastern shore of north carolina whoever will secure the said brick layers so that he may be again 
shall have five pounds reward beside what the law allows all right so they're like please bring back my irish man my irish man now it says virginia gazette parks williamsburg from august 10th to august 17th 1739 1739 right it says ran away the 8th of july last from the subscribers living in westmoreland county four servant men with john McHugh, francis man daniel fitzpatrick and john freelove john McHugh is an irish man of middle stature he's swarthy complexion he's an irish man john McHugh, mock mac remember the mac mac john McHugh is an irish man he's swarthy he has on one of his arms a bleeding heart pricked in gunpowder and name length. Several other letters. All right. So, okay. Then we get uh, Francis Mann. Francis Mann is an Englishman. All right. So now we got an Englishman, right? Not a, just an Irishman. We got an English, a Briton, right? An Englishman, a middle stature, and he's also swarthy complexion. It says here, Proclamation 1625. America's enslavement. Of the Irish by Herbert L. Byrd Jr. Continuing a little bit further in the book, it says here, Chapter 7 The Irish became white. Huh? The Irish were not considered white and were not accepted in white society. Their skin color didn't automatically qualify them to be classified as white. All right, dodged the hijack because it really wasn't about the skin color, you know, deep down. That's why they weren't considered white, because they were, a lot of them were swarthy, as we just got, dark complexion, right? They were seen as lacking culture and unable to govern themselves. Many European immigrants, groups arriving in America, were classified as other. This was a probationary white status until they were completely accepted. Now listen to this, but the Irish were classified as colored a classification also given to American blacks again, but the Irish were classified as colored. The Irish were classified as colored. You guys hearing this? A classification also given to American so-called blacks. All right. Colored. The Irish were classified as colored. Pay attention. The document shown below was taken from the blog of Michael O'Malley a professor of U.S. history at George Mason University who blogs at the Aporetic. It demonstrates that the Irish at one time were classified as colored. It also demonstrates the extent of passing in America. All right, let's take a look at that. All right, see where it says the yellow. Right under where it says grandfather, it says colored. Right there, it says colored. Patrick O'Malley. All right, I don't know if they did this on purpose or so you wouldn't be able to see, but we can see what it says. It says, this is the marriage license of my great-great-grandfather born in Ireland in 1854 and married to a Virginia native in 1884, a Virginia native, listen. And he's a colored Irish who married a Virginia native. You'll notice it's given as colored, all right? He's colored. Since when are Irish men colored? That's a good question. My father found this when he started doing family history after he retired. We mostly laughed a lot when he revealed it at a family Christmas party that year. He sent us all Kwanzaa cards as a joke. You hear that? They were making fun. They found that their great great grandfather was colored, a colored man from Ireland. But being a historian, I couldn't help but be fascinated. I read some of the literature on whiteness, notably Ignatius, how the Irish became white. And I'd been highly skeptical. It seemed to me to be sort of related to the kind of whining white college kids did about how they were discriminated against because they did not have a white studies program on campus. That's not what Inactive had in mind, but I thought the Irish were not white. Bit was wildly overstated. I was clearly wrong and looking into it a little more resulted in a whole class lesson around the image of the Irish in the 19th century and the range of anti-Irish nativism it focused on the melancholy of stereotypes and how what seems natural and obvious in one era seems odd in the next but still how to explain this document it was his marriage certificate surely even the greenest irish immigrant knew enough to avoid being classed as colored if you take a close look at it it gets more and more interesting here is the full scan all right so you guys can see it says colored so we got Patrick O'Malley, colored, Hester Holland, colored, 
All right, they both colored, all right? He's Irish, she's a Virginia native, <laughs> whatever that means. But we, know, we already know, most likely, indigenous. Right away, there are some oddities. His wife, Hester Holland, a Virginia native, is also listed as colored. Again, major drop. So we got an Irish man listed as colored who married an, a Virginia Indian woman, an indigenous woman, who's also being labeled colored. Do you guys see? This is real history. This is real genealogy. You got to dodge the hijack and stop saying, no, maybe they were tan. No, they were just being classified like that because blah, 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 nothing. These are colored people. These would be called so-called African-Americans today. This is a marriage certificate. This is the kind of things you find when you do genealogy correctly. Now, I want to prove something to you. In case people think this is just one case of an O'Malley who is colored or so-called black. All right. I'm going to prove to you that the original O'Malley dynasty founder was actually black, so-called black, a swarthy founder of the O'Malley dynasty. All right, real quick, just to corroborate, it says here Grace O'Malley. Who's Grace O'Malley? Also known as Graini O'Malley or Graini Umal, was the head of the O'Malley dynasty in the west of Ireland, okay? And the daughter of Eogan Dubdara, Dubdara O'Malley. All right, Dub, black, right? An Irish folklore, she is commonly known as Grainne Mahaul, English as Granuali, and is a well known historical figure in 16th century Irish history. It says in popular culture, she is often referred to as the Pirate Queen. All right, she's literally a female pirate, a famous female pirate from Ireland. Okay, why am I showing you guys her? found this in the Galway County Council Public Library. It says here, the Galway Reader. This is from 1951, volume three. Just want to zoom into this part right here. It says, some facts about Griana Wally. All right, same person we just read about. It says, it is strange considering her legendary fame, how little there is actually known about the pirate queen, Grace O'Malley, or Gruanue Wally, as it is in Irish, the four masters. Do not mention her, though it has mentioned her father, her husbands, and her sons. And except for a few unreliable folk tales, such meager information as we have come from English state papers of that period, letters that the English commanders wrote home to the state council in London. It seems that she was born about 1536, that is roughly about 400 years ago, and at the castle of Rockfleet, or Carinahuli, as it is called in Irish, a straightly built four-sided tower, three sides of which are surrounded by tidal waters situated on the coast of Mayo, Mayo or Maya, Mayo, Maya. There's a place called Mayo in Ireland, Maya, one letter off. Her father was an Owen O'Malley, who was nicknamed Dubdada or the Black Oak, the Black Oak. Why was he called that? On account of his swarthy complexion. He was black, so-called black, black Irish, Dubdada, the head of the O'Malley's. You hear this? The head of the O'Malley dynasty was nicknamed the Black Oak because of his swarthy complexion, because of his black dark skin complexion, which tradition says Gruanua inherited, which she inherited, okay? She's also so-called black. But this famous Irish pirate queen from Ireland was swarthy, okay? She got it from her daddy. All right, now we're going to read uh, from this book. It's called To Hell or Barbados, The Ethnic Cleansing of Ireland by Sean O'Callaghan. We're in chapter three of this book. It says here, one question still remained to be resolved by Parliament. What to do with the 34,000? Some historians put the figure as high as 40,000. Irish prisoners of war held in gals and camps throughout Ireland. Their upkeep, such as it was, had become a strain on the exchequer. Cromwell's solution to send them as slaves to Barbados was unworkable. It would have been feasible to send 30 or so he's had captured in Drogheda or even 300. But if 34,000 or 40,000 were sent, they would have outnumbered the planters two to one. Parliament finally decided to allow the men to go to any country of their choice 
not at war with England, France, Spain, Austria, and Poland. Listen, there was certainly a demand for these Irish soldiers abroad, Irish soldiers. Irishmen had been fighting in the various armies of Europe from the time of Queen Elizabeth I. Irish regiments served in the Low Countries, and many who had seen service in the Seven Year Wars returned to Ireland to fight the parliamentarians there. The Prize of Orange declared that they were born soldiers. Henry IV of France called Hugh O'Neill the defender of Clumnell and Limerick, the third soldier of his age, and stated no nation produced better troops than the Irish if they were properly drilled and led. Even an Englishman, Sir John Norris, praised their valor and said that he knew no nation where there were so few fools or cowards. Recruiting agents from many countries flocked to Ireland to enlist their services. Don Ricardo White in May 1654 shipped 7,000 men from the ports of Waterford, Kingsale, Galway, Limerick, and Bantry for service in the Spanish army. In the following September, Colonel Christopher Mayo sent another batch of 3,000 to serve the Spanish king. In chapter 6, it's called the Irish White Slave Trade. It says here, the commissioners of Ireland were only too willing to oblige Cromwell by getting rid of a surplus and potentially dangerous population. In January 1654, they ordered the governors of Carlisle, Kilkenny, Clonmel, Ross, Wexford, and Waterford to arrest and deliver to Captains Thomas Morgan, Captain Morgan, right? Thomas Morgan, the pirate, Dudley North, and John Johnson, English merchants, all right, so who's the merchants, Sephardic Jews, all right, crypto Jews, crypto Moors, Muslims, these are the merchants. All wanderers, men and women, and other Irish within their prisons, as should not prove that they had such a settled course of industry as yielded them a means of their own to maintain them. All such children as were in hospitals or workhouses, all prisoners, men and women, to be transported to the West Indies. The governors were to transfer the people who were rounded up to the ports of shipping, but these were to be provided for and maintained by the contractors. Sir William Petty, who had carried out the down survey of Ireland, described the Irish slave trade in his book, The Political Anatomy of Ireland, thus the widows and orphans, the deserted wives and families of the swordsmen were kidnapped and transported by the slave trading merchants of Bristol. All right, Bristol. We got that book from Bristol showing how Bristol was a big major slave port and sending all these Europeans to the West Indies. We got the primary sources, the historical records, listing the names and everything. So all these people being kidnapped and transported by the slave trading merchants of Bristol, all right, Bristol, which their previous experience enabled them to organize with advantage to themselves. In September, Captain John Vernon was employed by the commissioners for Ireland and signed a contract on their behalf to supply Mr. Selleck and Mr. Jomans Bristol merchants with 250 women above the age of 12 years to be found in the country within a 20 miles radius of Cork, Ugal, Kinsale, Waterford, and Wexford, and then transport them to Barbados and New England. Lord Broghill, governor of Cork, assured the commissioners that he could find in a short time the 250 within the environs of Cork alone. He's like, don't worry, I got you. I, I can find you 250 slaves right now just in Cork alone. I got you. Don't worry. Again, they're not in Africa doing this. Wake up. Elliot O'Donnell in his book, The Irish Abroad, gives an account of the fate of young girls seized for transshipment abroad. While in the majority of cases, those destined for the plantations were put aboard ships in Irish ports, O'Donnell gives an example of Irish girls shipped from Cork to Bristol and there put aboard a slave ship. It is a harrowing account. Between the years of 1651 and 1654, over 40,000 Celtic Irishmen, all right, Celtic Irishmen, the ancient Celtic all right, Irishmen marched away to die with all their accustomed gallantry, many winning unperishable renown in the services of France, Spain, Poland, and Italy. Having thus succeeded in deporting the men, Cromwell next turn his attention to the women Hearing that the planters in New England and the West Indies were wary of maroons and would pay any price for a white woman, so-called white, 
Puritan Cromwell at once volunteered to supply their needs, gangs of his soldiers invaded Connaught and pouncing on all the women and girls they could find, drove them in gangs to Cork. It was the work of 1603 over again, only on a much larger and even more revolting scale. The young pretty women were frequently violated, the older and uglier beating and branded. From Cork, they were taken to Bristol, and after being publicly sold in the market there, I right, so listen to this, publicly sold. Do you think this was really pale skin white people? They told, remember what they told you in school? They didn't tell you white people were being sold like this. So after they were publicly sold, they were trust on board ships and born to their final destination. The mind shrinks from imagining the horrors of their suffering at sea. From the records of survivors, they must have been at least equal to any of the sufferings experienced by African slaves on their way to America. All right, touch the hijack. But you see what he's telling you is the same thing. This is where they got, this is where Mr. Alex Haley got his ideas from. And also the book that he plagiarized, the other author got his ideas from so-called African. This is where they were reading. But as certainly did not happen in the case of the latter, their hardships excited no sympathy in England. The inhabitants of Bristol watched them being packed on board and driven below with the same dull curiosity and phlegm which they displayed in watching the embarkation of cattle. To them, doubtless, there was little to choose between a cow and an Irish Roman Catholic. Continuing, it says here, we shall never know the exact number of Irishmen and women and children transported to the living hell of the West Indies and the Americas. All right, they don't want to tell you it's a lot. The numbers vary from as low as 12,000 by R.F. Foster in modern Ireland, 1988, to 50,000 a year. 50,000 a year, and they're being modest probably. Now, remember how many years they were doing this for. 50,000 a year, which was the figure given by Cardinal Rinuccini, who described the desperate ply of the Irish put aboard the slave ships. The Reverend Father Thomas Quinn, SJ, who somehow managed to avoid capture and transportation, wrote a report in Latin to Rome entitled The State and Condition of Irish Catholics from the year 1652 to 1656. It stated in part, and so these heretics, the English, caused the poor Catholics to be sent in crowded ships to Barbados, crowded ships to Barbados, a middle passage, listen, and the islands of America and the other islands, such that those that did not die in the open remained in perpetual servitude, perpetual servitude, indentures for life, chattel, all right? That you ever hear of white, so-called white people being chattel? for life, perpetual servants for life. I believe that some 60,000, this is a primary source, listen. He said, I believe that at least some 60,000 were sent there. The husbands expelled first to Spain and the Netherlands, whilst the wives and offsprings were destined for America, such that there was a perpetual divor divorce. Thus what God and nature had joined the barbarous tyranny of the heretics separated. According to the Reverend T.N. Burke and his series of lectures and sermons published in the New York's Irish American in the last century, some 80,000 to 100,000 men of Ireland were driven south to the ports of Munster, where they were shipped to the sugar plantations, sugar plantations, again, sugar plantations of Barbados. These are not Africans. All right, this is in uh, chapter seven. It's called The Slavery of Sugar. Right, and it's very interesting. It clearly states here who really set up the sugar plantations in Barbados. Um, and we have already gone over this, who really started this stuff was really uh, back in Africa. And uh, <laughs> the Muslims were doing this, the Arabs and uh, Morocco especially. And, um, and then Sephardic Jews and Muslims were bringing this skill with them uh, to the Americas. It says here in the bottom, it says the Sephardic Jews brought their know-how of sugar milling their capital and their slaves with them to Barbados. And again, Sephardic Jews are people of color, so-called Negro people, especially in these colonial times. Wherever they went, they brought with them their skills as businessmen and their experience as sugar planters, refiners, and brokers. 
They also brought with them the machinery needed for sugar refining and advanced money on long credit to the planters to buy it. They taught them the art of planting, harvesting, and milling, and most important of all, sold them their black slaves, so-called black slaves, again, either on long credit or against the first refined sugar produced. Before the advent of sugar, there were only a few hundred black slaves on the island purchased from Dutch slave traders. Who's the Dutch? Now let's go back to the previous videos, how we all broke this down. Sephardic Jews, who were they really enslaving and all that? Says so Cromwell thought his victories in England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland solved their problem by shipping prisoners of war to Barbados. This not only solved the problem of what to do with potentially seditious population, but also earned money for the Commonwealth. These prisoners were not sent as indentured servants, but were sold in perpetuity to the sugar planters of Barbados. Listen, because a lot of people always say, Curimeo is not the same. White people got freed after. No, it's, you, you're not overstanding real history. The, the false slave narratives they gave us are not correct. That Kunta Quinta stuff, that was just a movie. Again, there was Irish, right? Europeans being sold in perpetuity, meaning forever, not as indentures, to the sugar planters of Barbados, sugar plantations. Where are these so-called white people's descendants if that was white people? Where are they? Old records in the Barbados Museum and Historical Society files show that according to planners estimates barbados alone received thousands of prisoners again thousands of prisoners of war who were regarded as white slaves all right so-called white remember a survey carried out in 1650 even before the advent of the irish white slaves there showed that the island had a population of 20,000 white men the first evidence we have of white men being sold is from wales where 240 Welsh bachelors were sold in May 1648 for a shilling each and shipped to Barbados, all right? Now, I want to emphasize that in these years, nobody was using the word white in the primary sources. We've already gone over this. Make sure you guys catch up to the previous presentations. If all these people were so-called pale skin, where are their descendants in history? Because all these islands, we already know in modern times, when we came to be, in our lifetime, all we saw was people of color living there. It would, it sh there should be more so-called white people there today. People should be more lighter, according to what we're seeing with these numbers here. 10,000 prisoners were taken at the Battle of Worcester, all right? 10,000 prisoners, mainly Scots, all right? Mainly Scots. We already know about the Scots. All right, Scots with some German mercenaries is going to say, all right, Scots and German mercenaries. This is chapter 11, again, of the book, To Hell or Barbados, the ethnic cleansing of Ireland. It says here, the cabbage stock soldiers. Oliver Cromwell's Western design, which led to the subsequent capture of Jamaica, involved Irishmen, both indentured servants and slaves. Firstly, as impressed and unwilling soldiers in the expedition against the Spaniards, and secondly, as settlers in Jamaica. All right. So they get rid of two birds with one stone, right? Get rid of the people they don't want in Ireland and then use them as soldiers and settlers in Jamaica. Cromwell's grandiose scheme for the capture of all the Spanish held territories in the West Indies was a flawed one, based almost entirely on. In adequate intelligence and unsound advice from men like Martin Knoll, Thomas Povey, and man named Thomas Gage. Martin Knoll had come long way from being a poor tobacco planter of 1638. His slave and activities in sugar plantation had made him a very rich man. He left Barbados in 1650 and the following year became an alderman of the city of London and a member of the East India Company. The first group of Spanish settlers had arrived in Jamaica in 1510 under the captaincy of Diego Columbus, son of the great explorer. They called their chief town Villa de la Vega, which is now known as Spanish Town. When the settlers arrived, there were about 100,000 Arawaks living peacefully on the island, whom the Spaniards attempted to Christianize and enslave. Listen to this. Who did they enslave? 
they didn't bring Africans with them. They didn't go to Africa and brought Africans to help them settle and create this uh, Spanish town, right? Well, who did they enslave? Arawaks. They had already people there to enslave. Again, where's the Africans? After a few decades, the Arawaks were almost wiped out. Oh, really? They were wiped out? Or, were, or did you enslave them and started classifying them as Negroes? Bishop Bartholomew de la Casas wrote of the Spanish cruelties in Jamaica, which bore out Thomas Gage's version. The island of St. John in Jamaica that looked a fruitful garden in 1610 was possessed by the Spaniards with the same bloody intention as the others were, for there they also exercised their accustomed cruelties, killing, burning, roasting men, and throwing them to dogs as if they had come to rid the earth of these innocent and harmless creatures, of whom above 60,000 were murdered in these two islands so lavish were the Spanish swords of the blood of these poor souls, scarce 200 more remaining, the rest perished without the least knowledge of God. The fleet arrived at Jamaica on May 10, 1655, and the troops landed almost opposed at a place called Passage Fort. The small Spanish force retreating towards Spanish town, the capital, Venables and the other army commanders, instead of a swift pursuit, held a council of war. After a couple of wasted days, they advanced warily, always fearful of an ambush. They were talking about the cabbage talk soldiers, all right? These were Irish indentured servants being forced, all right, to go there and fight for them. The weak Spanish garrison of less than 1,000 men decided to surrender and send emissaries under a flag of truce to the English commander. Negotiations dragged on for a week, and this gave the inhabitants of Spanish town time to hide their valuables. All right, so that was the story of the cabbage tax soldiers who were, you know, some of the first Irish settlers in Jamaica. They came in to help, uh, you know, fight, you know, get rid of the Spaniards, the Catholic Spaniards who were there. So it says here, chapter 12, the Irish in Jamaica. Now, in this, uh, in this chapter, it talks about the cabbage stock soldiers and what happened to them. It says, for a start, all the soldiers with the Western Design Expedition, including the cabbage stack soldiers who were mainly Irish indentured servants and slaves, were to be freed and given 30 acres each. There were, however, not nearly enough of them. Of the 7,000 men Venables landed in Jamaica, 3,500 had died of various diseases and another 700 had been killed in action against the Spanish and Maroons during the conquest of the island. So it seems they were having a hard time really getting uh, Irish people to go there um, it's, it's, and settle and colonize. So it says here indentured servants were to have their indentures cut short and select Irish slaves were to be given their freedom if they agreed to go to Jamaica. They were also to be given 30 acres of land. In that way, almost 2,000 were shipped to the island to begin work as freemen there. Yeah, you hear this? And a lot of those were black folks, so-called black Irish. It is ironic that the very men who profited from the sale of slaves and Barbados, Noel and Pavi, were now advocating their freedom. Cromwell, who bore the prime responsibility for sending them there, also advocated their transfer to Jamaica as freemen. He wrote to Governor Cyril, instructing him to encourage emigration to Jamaica and as a sweetener declared that Jamaican goods were to be free of customs for seven years in Barbados. You know, so this book is called Ancient and Modern Britons, a retrospect. This is from volume one. All right, continuing in the book, it says, but at any rate, the people known as Iberians were spread all over the British islands, whether indigenous or immigrants, and some of their tribes were known as Damoni and Siluris. This seems to be generally admitted. Physically, they were swarthy of color. All right. They were swarthy of color and curly hair and were bearded like, like goats. They or some clans of them worshiped the gods and both men and women professed the knowledge of the future. So then the Druids and Druidesses who had colleges in an island near the coast of Brittany who professed a knowledge of the future who the men at least were figured as bearded like goats and who worshiped the gods were dark-skinned, curly-haired Iberians of the tribe of the Siluris of the Moni. All right, they're letting you know, are they these original Celts? Perhaps this distinction does not exist, but at any rate, if the small dark Highlander and the black Celt to the west of Shannon 
be assumed to be the descendants of Iberians, it may fairly be argued that with so much intermixture with fairer races, during the last 2,000 years, the stuck must now be lighter skinned than then, and years the and its representatives of the first century must have been actually as black as Negroes. As a matter of fact, Pliny characterizes their complexion as Ethiopian. Ethiopian. That is, as black as an Ethiopian. And it may be that the curliness of their hair was of the same nature as a Negro also. Thus, the Negritos of Huxley, the owners of such skulls as those found in Caithness, Caithness may have been allied to the ancient Iberians. The wild tribes of Ireland were black men. It's hinted by the fact that a wild Irishman is Gaelic, a black Irishman, dubbed Iring Nock. But it is held by some writers, as stated a page or two back, that the title Scott was given in contempt by the enemies of this people and that it signifies school T. Vagabond. While there is no proof of the 15th century witness of the first advent of the gypsies in Scotland, farther the wild black Irishman of Queen Elizabeth's reign, with his plated hair, with his plated hair, his swarthy skin, and his fen land haunts, was virtually a gypsy, and his island was the mother country of the Scots. The speech of the Scots of Galloway was the Sermo Pictorum. The Moors were Picts, the gypsies, whether as Moors or as gypsies, whether as more or as gypsies, both in parentheses, were pigs. They were pigs, really. By all these names, substantially the same people are intended. By all these names, by all these names, substantially the same people are intended. Same book, the a description sky. of the Western Islands of Scotland and the Isle of Gigae. So the inhabitants are all Protestants. Because a lot of the times they'll be like, oh, we had a shipload of Protestants come from Ireland or whatever. And we're just, oh, a bunch of white people, right? That's what we're all assuming. And that's what I'm trying to help break that spell. The inhabitants are all Protestants and speak the Irish tongue generally. There being but a few that speak English. They are grave and res reserved in their conversation. They are accustomed not to bury on Friday, they are fair or brown in complexion and use the same habit diet that is made use of the adjacent continent isles. All right. It says about a league further of the south. All right. So this is about the island of Judah. It almost sounds like the island of Judah. Just replace the R with a D. Judah. Judah. It says the natives here are very well proportioned, being generally black of complexion. And free from bodily imperfections, they speak the Irish language and wear the plaid, the plaid bonnet, as other islanders. All right, the plaid. And it says here, the races of Europe, a sociological study. Lowell Institute Lectures by William C. Ripley, Ph.D., Assistant Professor of Sociology, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that's MIT. Lecturer on Anthropology at Columbia University in the city of New York. All right. We are strengthened in this assumption that the earliest Europeans were not only long-headed, but also dark-complexioned. By various points in our inquiry thus far, we have proved the prehistoric antiquity of the living Cro-Magnon type in southwestern France, and we saw that among these peasants, the prevalence of black hair and eyes is very striking. In comparing types in the British Isles, we saw that everything tended to show that the brunette populations of Wales, Ireland, and Scotland constituted the most primitive stratum of population in Britain. Furthermore, in that curious spot in Gard Fagnana, where a survival of the ancient Ligurian population of northern Italy is indicated, there are also are the people characteristically dark. Judged therefore either in light of general principles or of local details, it would seem as if this earliest race of Europe must have been very dark. It was Mediterranean in its pigmental affinities and not Scandinavian. A new phase of the matter was presented by Broca's celebrated researches concerning the physical characteristics of the French people in the decade following 1860, especially those among the peasants in Brittany. Here were the only Celtic-speaking people on the continent, and they were of a brunette and short race. Then in 1865 came the monumental work of Davis and Terman. The Crania Britannia was added proof that a large part of the Celtic-speaking population of the British Isles 
particularly the Welsh, were equally short and of a dark complexion. Short and dark. All right. So the three main physical types in Scotland are well represented by our portraits at page 324. The upper pair, raw boned and red headed, is familiar enough, as also the equally tall, heavily built but dark type illustrated in our moray and inverness subjects. The middle pair, the little dark men, are representative of probably the oldest element of all in Scotland. All right, who? The little dark men in Scotland. All right, I know, and this was in uh, Ireland too. This corresponds closely to Salures of Wales or the small dark fir bulks west of Shannon in Ireland. The curly hair shown in both our examples is, I am informed by Dr. Beto, very common among men of this type. All right, so curly little dark men. Uh, ancient and modern Britons. Between the Druidists of the first century who prognosticated by the aid of the planets on the understanding that she was to receive payment for her divination and the Druidists of the present day who foretells by the same aids and on like basis there is great distance of time but a racial connection is quite visible between them. The former were of the swarthy, curled-haired and painted race that is known as Silurian. The latter belonged to Swarthy Sidivant, painted people, one division of which is described as curly-haired. And although the space that intervenes between these is very great, it can no doubt be filled up. The Druids of North British Kinglet, who figured in the Columban episodes, belonged to the 6th century. And to corroborate Pliny, not only have we, one or many, British tribes of the 18th and 19th centuries persisted in their own tradition that they were a tribe of Ethiopians and such people were in law Egyptians, Egyptians, but we have the same tradition asserted at a far earlier period by those British clans who derived their descent from the Gadelas, an Egyptian chief, and from Skota, the daughter of Pharaoh, Skocha, the daughter of Pharaoh. They got their descent, these Gadolins, these British clans, these British clans, Kosha, the daughter of Pharaoh, from which names those tribes were then known as Gales and Scots, the Scots daughters of Pharaoh, from Tamari, the island which was earliest British home of those alleged descendants of Pharaoh was Ireland, like I was just saying, these alleged descendants of Pharaoh in Ireland. And that island was once full of a race that possessed many Egyptian qualities, even in recent times. The historical names for these people, so far as concerns the British islands, have been assumed to be these, the painted Moors of anti cassarian Britain, known by such names as Silurians, and spoken as of Druids, all right, magicians, whose customs caused the nickname of blue skin. I blue skin, very important. Blue skin, all these blue deities and blue skin, Smurfs, Papa Smurf, blue skin. They're representing what? Moors, or people of very dark complexion, or green men. The green man is also a dark man, to be applied to them by Caesar. Also, the Scots of ancient Scotia, or Ireland, who seem to have left the island for Great Britain at various periods beginning so early as the fourth century you know here it says megalith the black builders of stonehenge all right by elmer von flesher the fitborgs tuatha danan the Nemedians, etc in irish mythology were pygmies the first inhabitants of greenland in the arctic circle were the twa they are mentioned in viking sagas such as the gralendinga saga and the eldrick saga Eric the Red found the Twa when he arrived in Greenland. They also inhabited northern Canada and parts of the Newfoundland and Massachusetts. The Norsemen called them Skrullings. All the early commentators described them as being black and of short stature. So you're going to read from this book, read from it before in my uh, indentured servitude uh, videos. It says here, colonist in bondage, white servitude and convict labor in America, 1607 to 1776 by Ahmed Emerson Smith. Now again, dash the hijack when you hear white, don't assume pale skin. Go to page 162 of this book, it says here, Irish. In considering the transportation of English and Scots, it has been convenient and natural to separate the shipment of political 
and military prisoners from the regular dealings in rogues, vagabonds, and felons. A clear distinction was drawn at the time, and the two processes rested on different legal and social bases. But when we come to Ireland, though the same distinctions existed, we soon find that it would be practically impossible and certainly unprofitable to disentangle political from non-political transportation. By far the largest number of Irish who were transported to the plantations were taken up as rogues and vagabonds under the provisions of 39 Elizabeth. But the reasons that there were so many candidates available was clearly political reason and the wretched condition of the island was due to the harassing of the English Puritans. Since the rebellion of 1641, affairs had grown steadily worse. Cromwell conquered a part of the island in 1651 and his government sought to remove the entire native population to the western counties of Connaught and Clare and to replace them in the east with Protestant Irish and with English soldiers to whom land grants would be given. I listened to this. They were doing this in Ireland before they started doing this in America, moving their local indigenous people, huh? Such a policy, of course, produced an appalling social disorganization and the emigration or transportation of the Irish was but one phase of the total situation. It would clarify the subject, nevertheless, if the several different aspects of Irish transportation be first outlined. Before proceeding to a more detailed account, the vast majority of people who left their country during these years went not to the colonies but to Spain or Flanders. It being customary to enroll large numbers of Irishmen in troops and take them abroad into the service of the King of Spain. A few of these rebels were diverted to the plantations, and in 1654 it was intended to send the troops of 400 thus to labor in the sugar fields, Irish. There were also a small and miscellaneous collection of felons, a person who failed to transport into Connacht, and of Catholic priests and teachers who were shipped to the colonies, while an unfulfilled project for people in Jamaica with 1,000 Irish girls, an unfulfilled project, huh? And 1,000 boys, which has enjoyed much celebrity, must also be examined. But as has just been said, most Irish who were transported to the colonies were taken up as vagrants by virtue of the Elizabethan statute and it was the abuse of this authority, not by the English government at West Westminster, but by the merchants, all right, the Sephardic Jews and Moors, and ship captains, as well as the magistrates who administered it in Ireland, that led to the well-known horrors of the Irish slave trade. From the earliest years, Ireland had been a fair field for the recruiting of indentured servants. The adventures of Thomas Anthony and the ship Abraham have illustrated the methods and extent of this trade and shown that it was none too scrupulous. A proclamation of the year 1625 urged the banishing overseas of dangerous rogues. Kidnapping was common. In April 1649, the Council of State ordered that some of 170 Irish taken in prisoners in a Dutch ship be transported. And Cromwell is reputed to have sent prisoners captured at Drogheda to Barbados. The wholesale removal of Irish began soon after this campaign and continued nearly to the time of the Restoration. In the latter part of 1651, numbers of Irish soldiers and fighters sought permission to submit upon conditions of receiving license to go to Spain at the expense of the Spanish monarchy. A certain Don Francisco Faisot had been employed in the country since 1644 as an agent of the Spanish government to raise troops his services now proved useful and the English authorities granted licenses for the emigration of many thousands of Irish and organized detachments. By January 1653, nearly 13,000 men had thus gone into Spanish service and when the king was behind hand in paying for their transportation, Cromwell himself reimbursed the unfortunate ship owners for he was glad to be rid of his enemies. Sir William Petty estimated in 1691 that 40,000 persons, of whom 34,000 were men, were transported from Ireland between 1651 and 1654. This figure has been generally accepted, and as it was not until 1654 that the numbers going to the colonies began to be considerable, 
it may be seen that the emigration to Spain was of remarkable dimensions. Transportation to the colonies began on July 9, 1652, when it was decided to write to the governor of Waterford to deliver such prisoners as he had in charge of Robert Can, Robert Jade, and Thomas Speed, merchants of Bristol. Again, the merchants of Bristol. Bristol was a major slave port whose ships were trading to the West Indies and who would take the lot as they had accommodation. In the next month, a license was given to Henry Hazard and Robert Immons, also of Bristol, to carry 200 Irishmen from any port in Ireland to the Caribbean islands, to the Caribbean islands as slaves, right? And on the same day, Robert Llewellyn of London was given 300 men. Thomas Speed is again mentioned in October as the recipient of 200 Irish rebels to be delivered to him by the commissioners. Again, here is your slave ships, ladies and gentlemen, along with all the other ones we've gone over. These are, however, the only records of the transportation of military prisoners to the plantations. Though a somewhat similar scheme was suggested in 1654, it may therefore be presumed that the number of such prisoners taken from Ireland to the colonies could not have exceeded a thousand, which is probably less than the number of Scots shipped. In May 1653, the commissioners appointed as overseers of the poor in various districts were ordered to deliver to Joseph Lawrence or his agents such vagrants and idle persons as were adjudged by any two of them to be incorrigible. In other words, the act of Elizabeth was put into operation and a proclamation of May 23rd expressly declared that all laws in force in England for the correction and punishment of rogues and idle people were to be enforced in Ireland. This order was amplified and the seeds of trouble were sown when on July 1st the overseers of the poor and every precinct were authorized to treat with merchants for transporting vagrants to America. The overseers were especially enjoined to ship only those persons begging and wandering in the country who came strictly under the act, but later events show that they did not observe this instruction. It is impossible to say how many shiploads of unhappy Irish were dispatched to America by the sole negotiation of the commissioners of precincts. No mention of such shipments would be likely to appear in the state papers, and no record of them is likely to be discovered elsewhere. They must have been very considerable in number, very considerable in number. Or again, Irish slaves sent to the colonies, plantations, very considerable. It is only in those cases of a merchant or captain who petitioned the government for special license to transport such vagrants that any information remains. So they're literally telling you a lot of these people didn't report it. In September, Mr. David Selleck of Boston and New England asked the Council of State for a license to transport 400 Irish children. And after a consultation with Edward Winslow, the council granted the request. Two ships, the Good Fellow of Boston, George Daly, Master, and the Providence of London, were designed for Mr. Selleck's project. And on October 28, they received permits to sail. Meanwhile, on September 14, Captain John Vernon promised Selleck that upon application to the Irish commissioners, he would be given 250 Irish women between 12 and 45 years old, and 300 men from 12 to 50. Lord Brockhill was authorized to search them out and deliver them, and was particularly cautioned not to send anyone who had any means of his own or friends to support him, thus making his activities come within a broad construction of the Elizabethan statute. The cargo was duly collected and shipped. Listen, they're just going around say, we need these many women, these many men, from these ages and they're like okay we got you give us some time we'll get it so look at they really got it. it says the cargo was duly collected and shipped and the reappearance of this matter in boston several years later may here be noted as a description of the method in which such instructions were followed all right boston right celtics boston boston celtics luck of the irish huh the fighting irish oh but you thought it was all so-called white people. No, this goes way back. We're talking about 1600s. In June 1661, William Downing and Philip Welsh came before the Essex County Court in Massachusetts and refused to serve their master, Samuel Simons, any longer. 
A bill of sale was produced from George Dell, master of the good fellow who sold Mr. Samuel Simons, two of the Irish Jews I brought over by order of the state of England for 26 pounds. A certain John King then gave testimony as follows. He, with diverse orders, were stolen in Ireland by some of the English soldiers in the night out of their beds brought to Mr. Dill's ship where the boat lay ready to receive them. In the way as they went, some others they took with them against their consents and brought them aboard the said ship where they were diverse of their countrymen, weeping and crying because they were stolen from their friends. They all declaring the same. And there they were kept until upon lords. Day morning, the master set sail and left some of his water and vessel behind for Hass, as I understood. All right, you understand this is real history. People crying, people being kidnapped taken from their families and thrown on ships and again a lot of these most of these are people of color so-called negro europeans irish okay the two men despite their plea were judged to serve two more years when such scenes as this were enacted where the highest authorities were concerned the performances of local commissioners must have been far more discreditable there was in fact a period of licensed kidnapping on a large scale with the magistrates and officers of the law actively conniving at it under some pretense of statutory sanction. Meanwhile, many other warrants were granted to Sir John Clotworthy on April 1st, 1653, for the transportation of 500 natural Irishmen to America to Richard Nettaway of Bristol on the September 24th for 100 Irish Tories to Virginia in the ships Golden Horse and Amity to some merchants of the city of Bristol for 400 Irish Tories to the Caribbean Islands in January 1654 and on January 20th a sweeping order for the governors of Carlow, Kilkenny, Clonwell, Wexford, Ross and Waterford to deliver all vagrants to Captain Thomas Morgan, Dudley North and John Johnson for transportation to the West Indies. All right, listen, you want to find slave ships? Here you go. Just keep adding it to the records and the notes and all the other so-called slave ships we have found already in previous videos. The numbers do add up, okay? Again, it was directed that no person should be apprehended under that order who was a member of any family and for whose good behavior the master of the family would answer. The vagrants of Limerick and Cork were ordered for Captain John Norris in April 1654. Sixty women from Connacht were granted to Colonel Stubbers for the West Indies in June, and all persons in the jails of Clummel, Waterford, Wexford, Kilkenny and Carlo were entrusted to John Milam Merchant, the merchant. But now the abuses of this trade in vagabonds were beginning to attract public notice. On December 22, 1654, the Commissioners General were ordered to send some trusty men on board a ship bound for Barbados to ascertain what persons were kept on the ship under color of the declaration for transporting vagrants to see whether the ship's officers had any warrants under the hands of two justices of the peace and in short to find out if the procedure had been by legal or illegal means at the same time all other vessels were ordered detained until they could be similarly investigated during the next two years the trade continued an occasional ship was searched and persons removed but no more licenses for transporting vagrants were granted by the council, and the arrangements must have been almost entirely in the hands of local magistrates. Complaints continued to come in, and finally on March 4, 1656-57, the Council of State revoked all orders for the transportation of such individuals and directed that henceforth they should be brought to justice in other ways. The language of this decree shows perfectly that shipmasters had used all their familiar methods of kidnapping trade under pretense of collecting rogues and vagabonds, all right? So literally, they were supposed to be grabbing these homeless people, people, you know, drunks and people just wandering the streets that had no families, you know, to get rid of them, enslave them and send them to the plantations, right? Use them, make some money out of them but they were actually abusing that and just kidnapping anybody they wanted and just saying they were they were vagabonds and that was not true. 
They employed persons to delude and deceive poor people by false pretenses, either by getting them aboard the ships or in other by places into their power and forcing them away. The persons so employed having so much of peace for all they so delude. Likewise, for the money's sake, they have enticed and forced women from their children and husbands and children from their parents who maintain them at school. And they practice such dealings not only upon the enemy Irish, but even upon English residing in the island. For these reasons, the trade in vagrants was abolished, and no further licenses were granted or arrangements made by the local officials. It is well to emphasize that the principal injustices connected with the transportation of Irish to the plantations arose not from the direct action of the government, but from the wholesale abuse of licenses granted under the provisions of 39 Elizabethan. Such abuses, if not effectively hindered by the Puritans, were at least no part of their express intentions. And indeed, they made some effort to ensure that no persons except genuine vagrants should be carried away. We now return to the year 1654, when one Peter Bath, who had been sentenced to death for refusing to transplant into Cognac, had his sentence changed into banishment to Barbados. There are only two more notices of the transportation of persons under this particular condemnation, and it is extremely unlikely that more than 150 were thus sent away. Most famous of all projects of Irish transportation was that for collecting 1,000 young girls and shipping them to Jamaica, where they would breed up a population for that newly acquired possession. All right. Did you guys hear that? You're talking about they were breeding African women to, to breed slaves, to breed African slaves. Where'd you get those stories from? What records? What sources? Who exactly? What Africans? Because they were actually doing this with Irish women. Listen, most famous of all projects of Irish transportation was that of collecting 1,000 young girls and shipping them to Jamaica, where they would breed up a population for that newly acquired procession. Diatribes have been written on this subject and pictures painted, and it has become one of the stock incidents with which to illustrate the brutality of Puritanism. There is not, however, very much substance to the whole story, though the letter of Henry Cromwell to Turlow on the subject makes painful reading, all right? So they say it can't be. You know why? Because these are supposed to be white people. So they're like, if it was white pe women, there would be more white babies. But look, all you see is so-called Negroes. But it is a real thing. They did it. There's a letter concerning the young women. Although we must use force in taking them up, yet it being so much for their own good and likely to be of so great advantage to the public, it is not in the least doubted that you may have such number of them as you shall think fit to make use upon this account. All right. That's Henry Kong. We're letting you know, hey, go ahead and do that. Take them. This was on September 11, 1655. On the 18th, he recommended that 1,500 or 2,000 boys of 12 or 14 years be sent also. All right. Also on the grounds that Ireland could well spare them. And who knows but that it may be a means to make them Englishmen, I mean rather Christians. Or on October 3rd, the Council of State duly voted in favor of shipping 1,000 girls and 1,000 boys of 14 or under, the allowance for each limited to 20 shillings. Then the business dragged along through the month of October, Henry Cromwell assuring Turlow that the girls could be ready at any time ships would call for them all right the girls are going to be ready just let me know when all right we'll get the girls don't worry you see they were doing this finally about the first of november turtle told henry that the next ships would be equipped to take the girls and that they should be ready to depart about the end of december that is the last record which exists concerning the matter it is impossible to believe that a dozen girls were ever sent to Jamaica without leaving a shred of evidence. Oh, you see what they're saying? Oh, they hid that. They were talking about it for so many months that they didn't do it. Yeah, they did it. Because we already got this on another video. We got another source actually stating, confirming that they did bring the girls over there. We got this already. The scheme considering the state of Jamaica at that time was fully as foolish as it was cruel. 
we may well believe that when fuller information came in concerning Jamaica, the shipping of boys and girls was abandoned in favor of the shipping of men. Henry Cromwell declared in September 1655 that many of the soldiers of the Puritan army in Ireland could be used in colonization. Now that their fighting was practically finished, accordingly he delayed the dispersal of his disbanded army until he should have fuller knowledge of the number of required in Jamaica and the terms on which they could be sent. Not until the summer of 1656 did the project really get underway when Martin Knoll undertook the transportation of 1,200 men from Cary Fergus at five pounds apiece, and then the ships went through so many misfortunes that the number arriving in Jamaica was scanty. Few things were dearer to the hearts of the Cromwells than the development of the island, which they had so recently conquered, and there is scarcely any aspect of colonial history during these years of which so much thought was expended and so many plans drawn up as the peopling of Jamaica. The peopling of Jamaica. 90% of these schemes came to nothing. Last of all, classes of Irish transported to the colonies were close, were those clearly sent away because of their religion. On July 22nd, 1654, it was ordered that all priests in Dublin should be transported into Spain but this was altered in the following January, so as to condemn all those in Dublin not found guilty of murder to Barbados. In the month of October, a murder in the townland of Lacan caused the entire population of some 37 to be sentenced to transportation, and with them at least two priests were ordered shipped to the plantations. Three popish priests were delivered to Mr. John Norris for shipment to Barbados in December 1655, and the governor of the islands was particularly instructed to see that they were so employed that the return to Ireland should be impossible. 26 priests and Catholic schoolmasters were gathered in Carrick Fergus in the summer of 1656, and it is highly probable that some of them went on the Jamaica ships that year, but no further evidence of their transportation to the colonies can be found. The ominous instruction of the governor of Barbados concerning the employment of priests so that they should not return has given rise to the dire suspicions and to charges that they were condemned to perpetual slavery. This was not so, and while the English government would doubtless have been glad to hear their deaths, there was never any such thing as perpetual slavery for any white man in the English colony. In Bermuda, the arrival of 17 servants, probably Irish, were recorded on July 17, 1657, and in November of the same year, an order was passed that the Irish should straggle not night or day, as too common with them. Further purchases of Irish servants were absolutely forbidden to any inhabitant of Bermuda. Nevertheless, in 1661, it became necessary to take measures for suppressing threatened insurrection of Irish and Negroes. Irish and Negroes working together, right? Likewise, the Irish became so turbulent in Barbados that a long order of council was necessary. On September 12, 1657, disarming and restraining the wanderings of all Irish and Catholics. You couldn't walk around if you were Irish. About the year 1666, the Reverend John Grace set upon a mission to the Roman Catholics in the British West Indies. His report is detailed, and the figures he gives are perhaps fairly accurate, though they apply, of course, to the whole Irish population and not merely to those transported during the Puritan Troubles. Father Grace computed that there were 12,000 Catholics in the Eastern Islands. Barbados, out of a total of 40,000 souls, had 8,000 Irish Catholics who were destitute of all spiritual ministrations. About 400 were in St. Christopher and Montserrat was entirely settled by 2,000 Irish. Again, Montserrat, which you're gonna see the video, like the video, like the video. Again, Montserrat, we've shown this before. 
all right the history of the irish in montserrat and you see them today they're they're colored folks and they're proud of their heritage again montserrat was entirely settled by 2000 irish a figure which certainly seems too large it seems too large huh 600 were to be found in nevis while many others were scattered through the small islands and some had fled to the french many other testimonies concur in regard to the irish and scots and barbados governor Searle wrote in 1655 to point out the danger of receiving so many disaffected persons particularly those of importance and other writers attribute the royalist outbreak which occurred there to the influence of these exiles rather than of the older inhabitants a letter of one of thomas Povey's correspondents indicates that barbados expected some favors because she had taken above 12,000 such persons i listen 12,000 irish and rendered them useful instead of menace to the commonwealth this is almost certainly an exaggeration yet it must be remembered that many royalists in barbados were not transported persons but voluntary immigrants the most detailed and diverting evidence respecting the irish in the leeward islands is to be found in various accounts of catholic missions to those parts there is for instance the extraordinary interesting story of father john stritch who founded a chapel in the French section of St. Christopher about 1650 and ministered, to, and ministered to many Irish from the English part of the island. After three months' labor, the good father went to Montserrat, where he disguised himself as a timber merchant and conducted secret worship in the woods. Upon returning to St. Christopher, he found that English had forbidden their servants to go into French quarter Nevertheless, many of the devout came secretly, even at the risk of great hardships. The English eventually took 125 of the most zealous Catholics and immured them upon the desert islands of the crabs, leaving them there to perish. Some of them managed to put to sea and were driven far and wide by a storm, passing many days without food or water. They were sorely tempted to save themselves by the sin of cannibalism, but piety asserted itself and no sooner had they resolved upon the alternative of death than a large fish appeared, which oblingly allowed itself to be caught by their unassisted hands and provided them with food until they reached land. According to another version of the same story, 300 Irish were carried in chains to the island where, where all but two perished. All right? Irish carried in chains to the island. Listen, these two in desperation leaped into the sea where one drowned but the other, who was truly Viribus, volunteer at Continentum Matando Prevenit, <laughs> and reported the sad fate of his companions. It is to be feared that these accounts were designed more to fortify faith than to increase knowledge. Generally speaking, the transportation of Irish has been interpreted in a political light and the process seen as the logical development of Puritan ferocity. This is not wholly just. The devastations of war and rebellion must have produced an exceptionally large number of vagrants and starving people of the same kind that were habitually shipped from England and Scotland. Emigration of servants from Ireland was always great in volume in the 18th and 19th, no less than in the 17th century. And it was due very largely to the unstable economy of that agricultural island. Without any government interference, a large increase would have been expected during the 1650s. To be sure, the Irish refused to be conquered, and vast numbers of them went to Spain under the command of their own officers to live in a more congenial country than their own had become. Of those who stayed behind, however, relatively few were shipped to the colonies by the direct action of the government exercising vengeance on its enemies. The Puritans should not be too harshly blamed. It is nevertheless true that the fundamental cause of the deplorable economic conditions of Ireland in those years was political and that the saints very largely created the vagabonds whom they ordered to be transported. They did not supervise effectively the magistrates and merchants who collected vagrants. They took little trouble over the difficult distinction between an Irish rebel and an Irish neutral and an Irish rogue. They were glad to be rid of as many as possible, whatever their classification, they didn't matter. Hence, we really do but little violence to historical truth in ourselves, treating rogues, vagabonds, felons, military prisoners, priests, teachers, and maidens, all under the head of political 
victims. Right. Back at the Irish Times, it says, Welcome to Sligoville, the story of the Irish in Jamaica. <laughs> Cromwell sent many Irish to Jamaica in the 1600s. The emigration continued for more than 200 years. All right. All right. <laughs> so think about that. Thousands and thousands of black Irish being sent to Jamaica for at least 200 years. So where's all the Africans? So if you have all this African labor, why would you continue to send Irish to your plantations for 200 years when that's, you know, you have to pay them, you got to free them after seven years, they're indentured and all that. Because in reality, a lot of the black Irish were the ones that they told us in school were supposed to be from Africa. How a lot of these indenture servants, their indenture was for life in these plantations. They didn't have no freedom. A lot of them, that's why a lot of them became maroons and ran away. It says here, King Street in Kingston, Jamaica, circa 1800. Look at that. King Street in Jamaica, Kingston. Welcome to Jamra. In the mid-1990s, I attended a St. Patrick's Day party in Israel where most of us were Scottish, Welsh, and Irish. A man from Jamaica joined our crew. He sang along to the Irish songs and even had his own version of the song. Listen to that. He even had his own version of the song, meaning he had the original version. The wearing of the green. I assume the Jamaican liked Irish folk music or had spent some time in Ireland. He told me he'd never been to Ireland. However, he identified his heritage as Irish. The Jamaicans let him know like, hey man, no, no, I've never been to Ireland, but I'm Irish. Most of us born in Ireland pre-1990 will have attended a Catholic school, sat beside a white Irish child, taken a white boy or girl to our depths, and had little to no interaction with people other than Irish, Catholic and white. As a, as a blow in to the rural town, I was as foreign as I, it, it got. At that age, I could tell from certain surnames where their family originated. In my home country, families with surnames Ryans, Dyers, and Ellis can trace their ancestry back a thousand years. Knowing at least that much, I looked at the Jamaican and noticed the obvious. He didn't look like the Ryans or Dyers, I knew. And most notably, he did not look like he had any Irish heritage. All right, so dash the hijack, because this guy, you know, he's like, oh, he looks African to me. What are you talking about? When the internet became accessible, I researched the Jamaican link and found a few staggering facts. The extent of Irish emigration to the Caribbean and Jamaica was so prolific that a staggering 25% of Jamaican citizens claim Irish ancestry. And those are the ones that know, right? The second largest reported ethnic group in Jamaica after African ancestry, Dr. Haja, what Africans? Do you see? So we know based on previous videos and research and all the primary sources of who the Dutch, English, Spanish, Portuguese were enslaving, they weren't bringing Africans. We have already debunked all this. So you got to really think about it. It could be even higher, that percentage. That's what I'm saying. Because this article and all these people are based on this thinking it's white people, white Irish, that came in and mixed with Africans, right? So let's touch the hijack as we read this. The first Irish immigrants to Jamaica arrived more than 200 years previous to my Jamaican friend's 1850 ancestors, all right? The black Irish were there 200 years previously. We ain't talking about the 1800s. Uh, As it says here, this is from the uh, the Gleaner, the Jamaica Gleaner, uh, newspaper established 1834. Sligoville, Jamaica's first free village established to prepare for emancipation, huh? Free, huh? So it says here, James Filippo, an English Baptist minister, an anti-slavery activist stationed in Spanish town purchased 25 acres of land for 100 and established the first free village in the West Indies. The first free village in the West Indies, the land was subsequently divided into quarter acre lots, which the freed slaves could purchase for $3 each. All right, so I want to go back to the Irish times again. Let's not forget what we just read. Welcome to Sligoville, the story of the Irish in Jamaica. Irish, who's getting freed? says the, the first former slave to purchase land in Sligoville was former Hampstead estate headman Henry Lunan. What became known as the Free Village system resulted from this first settlement and similar villages were established throughout the island, most of them by ministers of religion, 
who supplied land to the ex-slaves who had never owned land before. Now we're going to read, and we already got on part one, who were the slaves for 200 years that were sent into the West Indies in Jamaica, right? Let's not forget about the Black Irish who were being enslaved and sent, transported by force to the islands of the West Indies. Originally named Highgate, the village was renamed as Sligoville after Howie Brown, Marquis of Sligo and Governor of Jamaica, right? Howie Brown, really? No, we're going to get a body snatcher, guys. Check this out. Howie Brown, second Marquis of Sligo. This is the painting they got, right? This is the painting they got with his red cheeks. <laughs> so all I know is that his last name is Brown, right? His last name is Brown. It says Brown, Ireland, England, right? Family. It says the nickname Brown is derived from a nickname of a person with brown hair or a tanned complexion. Tanned complexion. Really, swarthy complexion, huh? The, so it's from the Gaelic origin, the Gaelic form of De Brun or Le Brun. Brun, right? Brun, dark, dusky. Brun, brown, brun, dark, dusky. The surname Brown is meaning an origin. It says here, it refers to the color of an individual's complexion refers to the color of an individual's complexion the color of his hair or even the color of the garments but that's the hijack we already know case of brun the color brun is defined as a dark red dark red going on black dark red going on black okay in french that's from the dictionary de la academie de france all right dark red so brun is dark red going on black red man <laughs> and brunette we have a brunette complexion of a dark brown color of a dark brown color brun so sligoville first free village in jamaica and we already know the irish were there now listen what it says about sligo it says sligo was sent to jamaica to oversee the transition from the apprenticeship system to full freedom in 1840 from what Hold up, hold up. So what do you mean, Kurimel? You mean he wasn't freeing African slaves from chattel slavery? No, it clearly says right here, Sligo was sent to Jamaica to oversee the transition from apprenticeship, from the indentures, their apprenticeships system, the encomienda system to full freedom. Irish American Magazine, established 1985, says here, Slantiman, the Irish of Jamaica. <laughs> this is a famous poet right here he's irish the one in the middle that irish is jamaica's second most predominant ethnicity may come as a surprise especially to those outside the country it all started in 1655 when the british failed in their efforts to claim santo domingo from the spaniards and took jamaica as a consolation prize of course the british also had been quite active in ireland where between 1641 and 1652 about half the population had been wiped out oh really they just were wiped out famine and plague played roles in this decline another lesser known fact was slavery as part of his western design lord protector oliver cromwell was expanding his ventures in the caribbean as part of his settlement in ireland he was tyrannizing many of the natives to enslave irish natives irish natives and transport them to the west indies was a fine way to unite both agendas Elliot O'Donnell's 1915 book, The Irish Abroad, paints a rather vivid scene. Gangs of soldiers invaded Kana and pouncing on all the women and girls they could find, drove them in gangs to Cork. All right, people being snatched up, just like they told you the Africans were being snatched up, families being taken apart. This was really happening in Ireland. This was black Irish. I want you guys to really picture this. They told us the wrong places. Now, what's interesting about this is that many Irish of today, I'm talking about Pelskin Irish, would say that, oh, Jamaicans or Montserrat or some people Montserrat sound like they're from Cork. They're like they're from Cork, Ireland. Well, there's a reason for that. Look what they're telling you here. They drove them in gangs to Cork. At Cork, the slave catchers began to assess their plunder, among other activities. Back in the Irish times, it says here the Caribbean Irish, the other Emerald Isle, with many islanders claiming Irish ancestry, Montserrat is proud of its green history, even if it defies the notion of the nice Irish slaveholder. 
Today, however, its focus is on rebuilding after natural disasters. All right, we're gonna get into a video from Montserrat. Just wanted to show you guys this and just look at it. It's all over the internet. You guys can just research it. It's more than just being part Irish, you know, and the whole African story has to be rethought. There is no real proof of it. There is more proof where these ships were really coming from. Before they were even bringing Europeans, we already know that they were coming here and depleting the native, the local indigenous population first, using them, enslaving them. And then they were getting rid of their undesirables in Europe. So it wasn't really Africans. I hope by now you guys are overstanding from all these presentations and everything we're learning that it's the rabbit hole is much, much deeper. And again, this ain't about hating anybody or hating Africa or going at Pan-Africans. We're just trying to set the record straight. We're trying to correct false narratives. We got to tell the truth. We got to tell the real stories. No matter how you feel about it, no matter if you get all emotional about it. Worshippers wearing the Montserrat national dress of Irish Tartan, the national dress of Montserrat. Attend mass in the town of a lookout. Customs officers stamp shamrocks in the passports of visitors to this tiny West Indies island. Okay, that's how deep it is there. It's its Irish heritage in a big way each year around St. Patrick's Day. They call it Green Week. And as our Melissa Noel found out, the festivities are also a commemoration of the island's freedom fighters. Celebrating St. Patrick's Day is so special here on the island of Montserrat that they don't just do it for 24 hours. They celebrate for an entire week and culminate with a major parade through the streets of Salem. <laughs> St. Patrick's Festival is unique because it highlights the blend of African and Irish heritage that's distinctive to Montserrat. It brings the people from the diaspora, especially. It brings them, it brings the, the, the younger people who have relocated, those who were born during or, or a little shortly after the, the volcanic crisis. It brings them back home. All right, so I just want to say so, where's the Irish part? Like, where wouldn't, shouldn't they look more? what they would consider mulatto, like shouldn't they be more so-called uh, mixed, right? Uh, I'm not saying they should be. I'm just saying according to what they tell us always, right? So what we've been reading, right? Okay, and we need that. So we got to the hijack big time. We just want to add to what Cudi Mill said. <laughs> you know, again, all right, we might be seeing an actual Armorican, ancient Armorican right here. And she's like, I mean, I'm telling you, they're so into their Irish ancestry in Montserrat then it's not like oh we you know we think we're little I no, they're Irish they call themselves Irish now she said African what Africans we saw it was all a bunch of indentured servants Irish Scottish right they were being sent right I showed you the book yesterday the Bristol registers right from Bristol I showed there was a black population in Bristol I showed you they were ending up in Montserrat a lot of Irish in Montserrat all right, so let's dodge the hijack. I know we'll, we'll fall right back into the spell. And I know she don't know no better, so I'm not trying to disrespect her. I don't know if she's done her genealogy, like, fully, or if they've told her, no, you guys are half slaves, half African, and they just run with it, you know? Because that's what these people, these gatekeepers do. And there's one big gatekeeper, they're going to interview him in this parade. And he's all dressed like Marcus Garvey was with his Freemasonic clothing. And he said, oh, the Irish decided to rebel on St. Patrick's Day. I mean, the, the, the slaves decided. So the slaves decided to rebel on St. Patrick's Day. Really? And they're here. We need to just cultivate the culture, let them see it, let them share it so that it can be carried on. Amid the shamrock shirts and suits was the sweet sound of steel pan and people dressed in traditional masquerade attire. It's a celebration of all things Irish and Caribbean at the same time. The experience is one that people from all over the world come to Montserrat to be a part of. I can't imagine spending St. Patrick's Day anywhere else. We're enjoying the hospitality. Yeah. 
That's all good about the hospital. You feel like you're home. Yeah, everything is just really nice. What's also unique about this festival is why it was started in the first place. Not so many people know the African side, what happened in that, that glorious um, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 1768. Oh, not so many people know about that great St. Patrick's Day in 1768. I want you to notice the clothing he has on. If you're African, why you dress only like a hug nut? Why you dress like a hug nut, Hugo nut? <laughs> why you dress like a hug nut? If you're half African, where's the little African attire? Why don't you represent that a little bit more, huh? Why is he looking like Marcus Garvey? And like this guy right here on the right, who was a black European. Listen to what he's going to say. He's going to tell you that the slaves rebelled on St. Patrick's Day. Why would they do that on St. Patrick's Day? And we already know, Dr. Hyde, who the so-called slaves are, right? Indians and indentured servants. American Indians and indentured servants. Stop saying Africans. Stop lying to the people. I don't know if you know, man. I don't know if you know history or you're just a gatekeeper. Maybe I should give him the benefit of the doubt. He don't know. I don't know, but I, for some reason, I feel like he's on that hijack. I feel like he's on that hijack, touch the hijack. All right? The African um, slaves on the island decided that they were going to risk it all and go for, um, for freedom. It did not work, but, the, but the, the symbolism of what they did is what the, the spirit is what we're living today. All right, all right. So, you know, much love to the brother right there. So he's saying... You know, we're talking about not knowing the history. Um, can he show me, he's saying African, can he show me and prove to me that these were Africans that went, uh, that did the uprising on St. Patrick's Day? They specifically chose St. Patrick's Day to do the uprising? Hmm. All right, and uh, he said it didn't work. Dodged the hijack big time, all right? What are we really looking at? Are we really looking at Africans or the black, so-called black Irish people? that are being called African. And I'm not saying everybody is, because they told you, right? Irish and Caribbean, or Irish and what? Carib, Carib, Carib Indian, Arawak. This is a celebration of freedom and a fusion of cultures that makes for a St. Patrick's experience unlike any other in the world. In Salem, Montserrat, I'm Melissa Noel for One Caribbean TV. All right, we're going to get another video right here just to correlate again, just get a perspective of what I'm talking about, why it's, it's so much part of their culture in Montserrat. Most Montserratians have Irish names somewhere in their genealogy. Danny Sweeney. Morris Gibbons. Joseph Sweeney. <laughs> My mother reminded me this morning of the pluses that we got from the Irish. And one of them was the ability to throw stones accurately. They can pick up a rock or a bottle and you're in trouble. I'm also told that we learned to make stone walls, accurate cuts in stones and bricks. Uh, to make walls from the Irish. On the east side of Montserrat there is a lot of shipwreck. And that's why most of the white people from Ireland is it was living in the hills. Montserrat was once a white colony without any black people for a hundred years. And then the, after the Whoa. slave trade, that also changed. So the Irish, who was indentured, indentured servants, oh who were also classified as slaves, oh. was also, who mingled with the, with the blacks. And that's how I become this color. Oh my gosh, you became that color? So the Irish, who was indentures, indentures servants, who were also classified as slaves, and was also, who mingled with the, with the blacks, and that's how I become this color. Oh, that's how you became that color. All right, all right. <laughs> so much love to the elder right there. And uh, he told you, hey, 
Montserrat basically was a white island. That was a white Irish colony, really. It was more than half, more than 60%. They give you these numbers, but it was most of them are all Irish. And he's saying they mingled with the native, with the Africans, right? So they, they're leaving though. They're first of all, they're leaving out the Aborigines, right? The indigenous people, right? They're like completely canceling them out. And then they're telling you, well, they mix with the Africans, right? They have no proof of any of these people being African, right? Either way. Now, the other thing is, you know, he's he's saying that the, that they mingled in and, and now he's a colored man. But are we looking at some original Irish here? I'm trying to. All right. So I just want to add to, to what I was saying that day is he literally said for 100 years, Montserrat was a white colony. Again, remember white, they're only saying white because they know it was indentured servants. He said they were indentured servants like slaves. They were treated like slaves. He knows the history, yet he's saying he turned black. Can you hear, like, I'm saying, like, I don't know, like, you know, to me it's so silly, like, like I don't, you know, the, the oppression and, and, and the way we were so brainwashed and fooled that this person actually believes that he's an actual Irish person that became colored. He didn't say, I'm a black man. He said, I'm Irish, and now I'm this color. Do you guys understand what he said to you right there? And all I know is Irish. My uncle, Dick Willie, is Irish. My uncle, McClure, he's Irish. My other, Uncle Gibbons, he's Irish. My other, uh, Mackenzie, he's Irish, too. We're all Irish. So how did we become, he's like, oh, we became this color. I guess we mixed in with the, uh, with the blacks, <laughs> with the crayon colors. And we got a crayon color now. That's what he said. He literally said that, man. He literally said that, all right? But at least he's admitting he's Irish. At least we'll give him that. Trace my family Gibbons in Galloway, in Ireland. I'm hoping someday we'll be able to connect the family from Ireland and the family the Gibbons in Munstrad in one. And um, I promise that if I found the Gibbons in Ireland, I'll share the land that the Gibbons have here so that we could be as one, Ireland and Montreal. There's a Montreal everywhere, from Alaska to Australia, you name it. There's a Montreal under a rock somewhere. And in the same way, um, I'm told that the Irish are everywhere and they all love homecoming. So we have a huge so homecoming. Not just the quilts, but now look at the border clothing. You've seen the Seminole clothing, right? Our native people in Costa Rica dress like this. The only difference is we don't have the Irish colors or the, or the um, I don't know what's it called, you know, the plaited Irish symbols and Scottish symbols, right? That was, we don't have, that's the only difference. So they mix their Irish culture with the native clothing gear. You see what they did? So where's the African culture? This is Irish and Indian, indigenous, Irish and indigenous clothing. Look at clothing. At Christmas, huge comb coming at St. Patrick's. So we have that close connection to our homeland. And that, I think, has come somewhat from the Irish as well. All right, all right. So now I want to get into, uh, you know, this book. I've actually been holding on to this book for many, many years, believe it or not. I know a lot of people have dropped it here and there and mentioned it. I always wanted to do the Black Irish Connection uh, video. So I've been waiting for the right moment. We had to go over so much things before so people wouldn't get emotional and think I'm trying to make them Europeans or just Irish or, or talking about self-hate or blackwashing or anything like that. I think uh, we're at the point where we are very informed now as a community. So these things should be looked at less with emotions and more with uh, historical historical reality and reference okay this is real now the book is called whence that black irish of jamaica by joseph j williams sj phd all right it says here jamaica irish in parentheses literally saying these are irish right it says standing collins walsh mckeon mcdermott kneeling is burke and mckay mckay huh from Ireland through Barbados to Jamaica, Lincoln McVeigh, the Dow Press, all right? And I got another version here because I don't have that version with that cover. This is the one I got right here. Again, whence the Black Irish of Jamaica. And right here is showing you a typical of the Black Irish in Jamaica, all right? Take a good look. That's a typical Black Irish. 
all right, from Jamaica. Joseph Williams uh, is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, fellow of the Royal Geographical and American Geographical Societies, honorary member of the Society Academy Internationale, member of the International Institute of African Languages and Cultures, member of the Catholic Anthropological Conference, member of the American Folklore Society, member of the American Catholic Historical Association. All right, so this guy got a lot of credentials. All right, so it says here in the introduction, visitors to Jamaica and the British West Indies frequently remark a semen anomaly and even the remotest sections of the bush and among the darkest of the Negroes who clearly trace their ancestry back to the earliest slaves from Africa. No, that's not true. Just because they're very dark. All right, just want to remind everybody. All right, we already went over this, right? I'm going to keep putting early Irish people were black with blue eyes. Early Irish people were black with blue eyes, okay? So dodge the hijack when they're talking about their Africa stuff. That's conjecture. We already passed all that Pan-African uh, false narratives. They will find distinctively Irish names. No matter literally what he's saying, it doesn't matter how dark they are. You're going to find Irish names. So common that in an unguarded moment, they are apt to give flight to the imagination and claim that they have actually encountered a touch of the brogue. All right. A few years ago in one school in Kingston might be found Burke, Collins, McKay, McDermott, McKeon and Walsh. And with one exception, the last named who was a dusky brown, they were to all appearances full blooded Negroes. In a single classroom of another school, there were Collins, Kennedy, McCormick and O'Hare. And here again, in only one case, did the features or complexion indicate any infusion of Caucasian blood. All right. Only one of them was light skin, he's saying, or look a little bit white. Although this one, too, was as black as the rest. He's still a so-called Negro. Listen to what he's saying. Perhaps one of the names most frequently met with throughout the island is that of Burke. In some few instances, it is true the name itself may be a corruption of that of the Haitian refugees, Dubourg who came to Jamaica in the 18th century at the time of the Haitian uprising. All right, that's a whole other history. We're gonna definitely get into two, I've mentioned it before. The usual explanation given for the presence of Irish names is, of course, that the slaves of former days were generally called by the family name of the master. And that's very false. These are your last names. We've shown the coat of arms. But in the case of Burke, at least, we do not find a single planter of that name among the early records of Jamaica. Boom, major drop right there. All right, major drop. He's literally telling you, you saw the guy's credentials. He did the research. He said, they tell us that most of these people got their Irish last names because they were slaves of an Irish white master, right? That he baptized them or passed it down to them. But he actually looked into Burke, right? And he found no plantation owners with that name. He didn't find a single planter of that name among the early records of Jamaica. So it's not a slave master name. Certainly the survey of the year 1670 shows that at that time, not one acre of land was owned by anyone named Burke. Okay. Debunked. And the same may, and the same may be said in the case of most of other Irish names we encounter today among the Negroes of the island. Okay. You guys listening? major drop here major killing all the pan-african lies that's not a white master name that is your last name from your irish ancestors that part of your tree that's coming from them it's not a slave master name okay he's telling you right here this is the case for most irish names today among the negroes of the island pay attention the purpose then of the present writer is to find a solution to the riddle whence the black irish of jamaica and the answer briefly summarized lends itself to a threefold division from ireland through barbados to jamaica it says here in chapter one from ireland Mary Gunn, writing about Jamaica 1922 in her chapter on the White Bondsman, states, To this boiling pot, Cromwell sent 1,000 Irish men and 1,000 Irish women. I can find nothing but the bare notification that they arrived. So they did make it. You'll get in other writings that they don't know if Cromwell was able to pull this off, if he actually was able to send with the 1,000 women and 1,000 boys, but clearly stating here that they did find a record saying they did arrive 
and it hardly seems to me those 2,000 Irish can have helped matters much, whether they were poor convicts or political prisoners, right? Again, black Irish that were coming in. In 1756, Dr. Brown, Brown was most emphatic in his statement. Cromwell, having had early intelligence of this conquest, Jamaica, resolved to miss no opportunity of supporting this new acquisition, which now indeed served him as another Siberia. And Edward Long, the historian who was Speaker of the Jamaica House of Assembly in 1768, when writing a few years later, only expressed a commonly accepted opinion in the island when he recorded that the Council of State in England voted that 1,000 girls and as many young men should be lifted in Ireland and sent over to assist in peopling the colony. All right, and there's sources for that. On May 11, 1655, Jamaica formally capulated to the representatives of Cromwell, the Lord Protector of England, and as early as the following July 18th, we find a document signed by the field officers of the army in Jamaica entitled, Several Considerations to be Humbly Represented to His Highness, the Lord Protector and Council Concerning the Army in America, wherein after bespeaking necessary equipment and supplies, the request is made that servants from Scotland or elsewhere may be sent to assist in planting. Planting. Who was going to be sent to the plantations? Servants from Scotland. And that included literally a lot of black Irish. They were living already in Scotland. For which the officers out of their pie will make such allowance as his highness shall think fit and assign them such proportions of land as his highness shall direct the expiration of their perspective of their respective terms. All right. So as soon as their indenture is up, they get to have land and be their own masters, right? Or plantation owners. There is in the library at Boston College, Newton, Massachusetts, an undated manuscript, presumably in the handwriting of Oliver Cromwell, entitled Certain Quarries Concerning His Highness Interest in the West Indies. The last two paragraphs read as follows. Whether His Highness' interest in the West Indies can be carried on without the settling of some course for the constant supplying them with people, whether the weeding the commonwealth of vagabonds, condemned persons and such are useless and hurtful in war and peace, and a settled course taken for the transporting them to the Indies, and thereby principally supplying Jamaica, is not necessary to be consulted. This was a pretty good read, uh, proven that Irish were sent to Barbados and Jamaica as slaves. He is quoting a lot of primary sources that we you know, going over. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like the same information, but make sure to read it on your own, get the full history, all the proof that, yeah, they were sending Irish over here and they were being treated literally, literally like the stories they told us in school about the treatment of African slaves. And even though we assume that indentured servitude is not the same, when we read these firsthand accounts, as they state in this book, he literally says that even though we say indentured servant is different when you read the primary sources of what these people were going through and what was happening to them it's the exact same thing that we hear about what's happening to supposedly african slaves this is a very scholarly source all right and he has a lot of primary sources here stating what they were doing to the irish and how they ended up in jamaica all right, so make sure you guys uh, get the book and um, go ahead and read it all. All the evidence, all the sources, letting you know how they were bringing thousands and thousands of Irish to the West Indies and to Jamaica and the treatment they were receiving. All right, so dodge the hijack with all the African stuff because they can't prove that. Now I'm at the Society for Irish Latin American Studies, Volume 5, Number 3, from 2007. It says Irish Migration Studies in Latin America. This actually goes over a lot of great content and the articles. And we're in this one, Irish indentured servants, Papists, colonists, and Spanish colonial Puerto Rico, 1650 to 1800. And it says here, the Irish in the Caribbean, following Oliver Cromwell's conquest of Ireland, Irish military prisoners, religious dissidents, and abductees were shipped out to the British Caribbean plantations as indentured workers. Historian Hilary Mac D. Beckles described the attitude of the British planners towards their victims. All right, listen to this. This is how they were treated. Remember, most of these are black Irish. 
English masters considered their Irish servants as belonging to a backward culture, unfit to contribute anything beyond their labor to colonial development. Furthermore, their adherence to the Catholic religion reinforced the planters' perception of them as opposed to the English Protestant colonizing mission that in fact had begun in Ireland, all right? These English, so-called English Protestants, they're Sephardic and Moorish uh, people, a lot of them. Crypto-Jews, crypto-Muslims, new conversos, right? Protestants, Huguenots and all that, right? And of course, they got beef with the Catholics. It doesn't matter about color. They're both, they are colored and the Catholics are colored. It's not about complexion. Irish servants then were seen by the English planter class as an enemy within and were treated accordingly. So it wasn't that they was just like farm help and slaves these were the enemy so so they were often mistreated by a biased judicial system imprisoned publicly flogged and banished for arbitrary or minor offenses labor unrest and other forms of resistance by the irish whom some english planters thought a greater threat than their african slaves huh what africans so the irish were more threat huh for a slave revolt were swiftly and brutally suppressed Many suffered slave-like working and living conditions, which often fueled anti-British plots and rebellions. Rumors of collaborative plots by Irish servants and enslaved Africans are other, other indigenous people and other black Europeans <laughs> circulated in the Bahamas in the 1650s and 1660s. So again, who's these enslaved Africans? Most likely indigenous Americans who are people of color and maybe possibly other black Europeans. Right, circulated in the bombs in 1650s and 1660s. The Irish rose up violently in St. Kitts in 1666 and in Montserrat in 1667, and later defected to the invading French forces. Over 100 rebelled again in St. Kitts two years later. All right, now this is a big one because they tell us that this insurrection, this, this slave revolt, was African slaves that did it on. St. Patrick's Day. It's clearly telling us right here, right, scholarly source, the Irish rose up violently, not the African slaves. These were the slaves they were talking about. The person saying, well, yeah, well, you know, when we were Africans, we, we rose up on St. Patrick's Day and we rebelled and we gained our freedom. No, it wasn't Africans. It's telling you clearly right here, the Irish rose up violently in St. Kitts in 1666 and in Montserrat in 1667 and later defected to the invading French forces. Over 100 rebelled again in St. Kitts two years later. In Antigua and Montserrat, the British conducted mass arrests and deportations of pro-French Irish servants. In 1694, Jamaica's governor, William Beeston, suspected that Irish papists were actively encouraging the French to invade the island. In 1729, the Jamaica Assembly passed an act to prevent dangers that may arise from disguise as well as declared papists. The measure responded to public statements by Irish servants to the effect that they would not fight the Spaniards in the event that they attacked Jamaica. All right, so 1700s still going on. A hundred years later, they're still having problems with the Irish slaves revolting and to their alleged secret correspondence with the Spaniards in Cuba. Following a pattern established by Amerindians, sea flight as a means to escape servitude became commonplace for both indentured servants and Africans. Who were they copying? The Amerindians. Who? So what does that mean? They were enslaving who? American Indians, right? And what were the Black Irish doing? Running away with them. Maroons. Maroons, right? African captives? No. What Africans? You still haven't proved any African yet. What African ship are you talking about? I know you can prove the Irish ships and the Indian ones. What Africans are you talking about? Remember, they're going to always add the hijack because these people are so-called Negroes. So they got to always try to say that there's Africans somewhere in there. But look what they're telling you. American Indians were being enslaved and they were the ones helping or showing some of these black Irish indentured servants slash slaves how to run away or escape into the sea. Ordinance says in St. Christopher or St. Kitts penalized anyone who sailed off with servants without authorization. An abridgment of the Acts of Assembly of St. Christopher 1740, right? That's where it's from. Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, and Cuba became popular destinations for the fugitives, right? Oh, you didn't know about that, right? 
all right? So all these fugitives, where did they end up? Some of them ended up in the other islands, Black Irish. The Spaniards often labeled the servants ingleses, English, but there can be little doubt that most such cases refer to the Irish, all right? A lot of the times we've gotten this before, many Irish and Scottish and other people, Germans, were being sent to England before they were being sent to the American colony plantations, and they would come in as English, but they were really from other countries, as it's telling you here. In 1657, two Dutch and two British Catholics, who claimed to have been held as slaves by the British in St. Thomas, they were slaves, who? Dutch and British Catholics, they were the slaves, not Africans. They had fled to Puerto Rico, all right? They ended up in Puerto Rico. So did the 21-year-old Irish servant Joseph Marquise in 1688 who absconded from the British Virgin Islands. Three more sought shelter in the western seaside town of Aguada in 1700. The anonymous Ingles married to a black female slave who led 36 African Maroons. All right, who's these African, so-called African Maroons? Dodge the hijack and four Amerindian captives. All right, these are probably other Indians from other parts of America or again, other black Europeans. And he led them to where? Puerto Rico to request asylum in 1715, was probably Irish. In 1763, the Irish servant Diego Sky fled to Puerto Rico along with a British companion from Spanish town, Jamaica. At the beginning of the century in 1701, alarmed by the frequency and magnitude of the maritime exodus, listen to this, alarmed with all these Irish runaways, these are not Africans alarmed with these Irish, black Irish runaways. Mar they call it marine time exodus. They're the freedom, right? They're exodus. The Jamaica Assembly passed an act to prevent freemen, white servants, Negroes, and other slaves running away from the islands in shallops, boats, and other vessels. Okay? See how they group all those people together? A decade later, Governor Hamilton reported that his counterpart in Santo Domingo sought to inveigle several Irish papists settled in hm colonies alleging it was for their interest to desert the tyranny these heretic dogs exercised over them as late as 1768 the authorities in cuba reported the arrival of irish escapees from jamaica listen this is huge they don't tell us about this history and genealogy in a lot of these places in cuba and santo domingo and puerto rico right all of a sudden they just become africans Despite the antagonistic climate between England and Spain and the latter's policy of harboring and freeing the Irish servants, Spain exercised strict control over foreign immigrants and a persistent but unrealistic attempt to keep the riches of the Indies from falling in the hands of non-Hispanics. Although the Spanish crown incorporated or collaborated with subjects from various parts of Europe, for example, Austrians, Italians, and French, the laws of the Indies strictly forbade foreigners from settling or trading in Spanish America. However, many non-Iberians, non-Iberians slipped past these prohibitions. Some had become Hispanicized prior to or after their arrival in the Americas, keeping track of their whereabouts in such a vast empire, particularly as they moved about within and outside their first points of destination was next to impossible. Some blended easily into their host societies, right? How, did, how can a white Irish with red hair freckles blend in with Cubans and Sephardic Jews and Moorish Spaniards, right? But listen what it's telling you. These black Irish, what happened? Some of them blended easily into their host societies because they looked just like the other people, stayed out of the way or built familial and economic ties with subjects of Spain in the Indies, further obstructing their detection, apprehension, and deportation. Since foreigners hailed from diverse social classes and occupational backgrounds, these factors often helped determine how they feared how they fared in the Spanish-American colonies. Researchers who write about them in monolithic terms fail to account for these important differences. To be sure, there were several distinct waves of Irish migrants in the Caribbean. All right, that's a big point I was saying earlier. There's different waves. Yes, there was a lighter, lighter skin <laughs> Irish wave later on more recently. Irish servants who sought asylum in Puerto Rico often came with little more than their shirts on their backs and gratefully repaid their Spanish hosts in a variety of ways. Now listen to this. Now be real and be honest and logical. When we were in school, right, did they ever tell you about any uh, white Irish escaping chattel slavery from the plant sugar plantations of Jamaica and ended up in Puerto Rico 
with little more than their shirts on their backs? No, right? They always told us African slaves or maroons, right? And they always wanted to assume it was all Africans. I hope you guys are really understanding what they're saying here. And based on the information, all the corroboration that we have seen that there was black Irish, it's no doubt. There is no doubt. Genetics has proven this. We got to break out of that mentality. And when we hear or read slave or the word Negro, that it means African, because it does not. Or that when we hear Irish, that it means white, because it does not. So it says like African Maroons, what African Maroons? You mean running with what Africans? So just like them, the Irish, right? Some willingly provided valuable information about the military conditions of Spain's Europeans rivals. Others joined the local Spanish militia or Navy. They also arrived at a time roughly from the 1650s to the 1760s when Puerto Rico was sparsely populated and in dire need of extra hands for its defense. All right, the black Irish helped out. During the course of previous research on marine time maroons during this period, I found no evidence that any servant was ever returned to their Danish, Dutch, French, or British masters. All right, so make sure to get the whole, the whole, all these articles in here, a lot of good info, you know, regarding the uh, Irish diaspora in the Caribbean, you know, things that never get mentioned in certain writings or historical or historical books. Says here, all the time something, a lighthearted peek into Jamaica's past, the Jamaica Irish connection. And who do we have here? We have Marcus Garvey, right? Famous Jamaicans, Bob Marley, Marcus Garvey, and Claude McKay were all African Irish descent. Dodged a hijack with the African, right? Bob Marley, yeah, yeah. It says here, next to persons of African descent, touch the hijack, people of color or Negroes, touch the hijack, all right? We've already debunked that. The largest racial ethnic group in Jamaica are Irish ancestry. So they're just trying to add the African because these are people of color. This is a surprise as many Jamaicans thought the next largest group to be East Indians. Now listen to this, all right? This part right here is deep. It is believed Marcus Mosiah Garvey who founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association in August 1914, had Irish ancestry. The Irish rising of 1916 appeared to have profound impact on and influenced the Jamaican national hero. That's what influenced Marcus Garvey? You mean it wasn't African things? The rising on Easter in April 1916 is a pivotal event in Irish history. It led to the partition and the cremation of the Independence Republic of Ireland. The rest of the island became Northern Ireland, a colony of Britain, which has had a long struggle for independence from Britain and reunification with the Irish Republic. In black and green, the fight for civil rights in Northern Ireland and black America, Brian Dooley said Garvey was one of the several black nationalists who studied and admired the Irish Republican approach. Listen to this. Garvey's Irish influences had begun as early as 1910 when he was assistant secretary of the National Club of Jamaica, whose founder S.A.G. Cox had admired the Sinn Féin movement while studying in the early years of the century. Dooley contended that Garvey based many of his black nationalist ideas on the Irish model. Noted Garvey scholar Robert Hill said as much in the Marcus Garvey and Universal Negro Improvement Association papers, far more than any other nationalist struggle, the Irish revolutionary struggle assisted in focusing Garvey's political perspective. Hill indicated that even the slogan made famous by Garvey, Africa for the Africans at home and abroad, echoed the oft-repeated Irish slogan, the Irish race at home and abroad, all right, he copied it, he plagiarized it, and he made it into Africa. Listen to this. Yeah, Marcus Garvey is actually Irish. He ain't African. All right, so real quick, want to take the opportunity uh, to invite you guys. If you have not watched my video on Marcus Garvey and his white friends, Marcus Garvey had many white supremacist friends. They had the same values, meaning they all wanted to send colored folks to Africa. And they funded him with his ships. So isn't it funny that he's Irish, actually, 
and that his values were learned from the Irish struggle. And he turned it into African. All right, so before we go, I want to read this uh, thing right here. A newspaper ad from the Pennsylvania Gazette, November 26, 1747. Now, put all everything we've learned into perspective while reading this. Run away the 22nd instant from James Greenfield of Newland Township, Chester County, an Irish servant man named Robert Clinton. All right, Clinton, Clinton, a weaver by trade. He is of middle stature with black curled hair, black curly hair, swarthy complexion, and about 20 years of age. Had on when he went away a new felt hat, a dark brown coat, a green jacket, right? A green jacket? Huh? A green jacket? Just like the Irish dress? Flaxen shirt and fine stock. Toe trousers, black stockings, footed with brown worsted, old brass shoes with large brass buckles. He was enticed away by one Sylvester Egan, an Irishman, by trade a weaver, and speaks very broguish. <laughs> but no servant, whoever secures said servant and sends word to his master, so as he may have him again, shall have five pounds reward and reasonable charges paid by. All right. This is a real historical runaway ad, clearly showing you that this Irish indentured servant or slave ran away and he had curly hair and was of dark complexion, swarthy complexion. Now, remember, this is in Pennsylvania. They're saying he spoke the brogue, all right? Now, that would sound like Patwa to somebody. You know, now picture this guy, right? Robert Clinton, he's a Negro from the 1700s, and he, speak, he speaks broguish, right? Sounds like he has that Patwa accent. Have you guys ever heard the Gulagishi talk? Some of them got this very heavy Patwa sounding broguish accent. Just want to give you an example. You know, grandmother said, now the buckle chill and go there. And don't look buckle in the eye. So I can't go over there now for play with them buckle then. And the island in had nothing but plantation. Yeah. And all they call on the white coal, you know. The cotton and the rice and all the indigo. They strip everything from. All the children that snatch out the air. Um, Care the baby this way, the mad that way, the pair that way. And they mean they had no sense of family at all. We have to let our young people know about the struggle. And I agree 100% with her. We have to let everybody know the struggle. And if these are your people, if you have Irish ancestry, you have to know the struggle they went through. Again, this is a runaway ad for Black Irish. Thank you.